look at his shadows. Don't look at his shadows. Don't look at his shadows. Don't, don't, don't. I love the concept that even when you're watching the trailer, it's like, don't watch this alone. Which after watching it alone, I wish I had followed directions. Mm. Um, why do you guys think that this movie is going to be so great. I think that j everyone loves jump scares. Everyone loves, and those are the best types of movies to go see with your friends True. or a date. And jump scares like are, I feel like the most, like everyone loves mm -hmm. like good jump scares. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's just too many options for me to get freaked out. What would you guys say as you're reading the script, as you're shooting the movie, you're like, wow. This is incredibly scary. Oh, I saw the little <laughs> shoulder move. Oh! Ah! Congratulations on freaking me out. I know that everyone is going to love this movie and not be able to sleep at night. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm uh... <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I told you. Tom, how could you? Well, hi. In an ad I saw for the 2018 Slender Man movie, I was told not to watch it alone as it is the most terrifying movie in existence or something like that. Needless to say, I took this warning incredibly seriously and made sure I had multiple people join me during any given watch through to ensure my protection. I'm joined today by my usual crew of Platinum Okami, Got Mittens, Grimpedia, and Teacap, and also happy to be joined by the likes of Madvocate, Southpaw, Evan Monroe, and Jake the Surgeon. And although I expect nothing less than for this movie to petrify me in absolute uncontrollable life-altering fear, I will press on in the name of the spooky scary skeleton season. I hope that you too will join us and will take solace in the hope that perhaps one day sleep will once again return to us. And so, without further ado, I wish you all a happy and utterly spine-chilling Halloween, and welcome you to the gurgling barrel of cat vomit that is Slender Man. Let's begin, shall we? How long is this um, piece of art? Uh, it is an hour and 33 minutes of pure terror. Yes! <laughs> As it turns out, Slenderman's strategy for fear-inducing horror is to make everything so goddamn dark that you can barely tell that your screen is on. This is a problem that is very persistent through the entire movie, aside from the daytime scenes where the editors couldn't think of a believable excuse for it. Their solution for these instances were to bring the contrast up to 98, making sure they hit that nice sweet spot right before the sunlight began looking dark. The color grading for this film oh, is God. really oh. awful pudding man it is so yeah. gray and dull and unsaturated it's just like it's, i think yeah, i'm I mean, not asking for like it to look all bright obviously but good god like to, yeah use better lighting for that wait no now it's changed like the sun <laughs> it's bright <laughs> what, what? <laughs> 
You know, they must have shot. You know what they must have done? They must have shot that over different days and used the same color grading. That's that's probably exactly what that was just there. Man. Oh god! I, mean, no. I think that that means the second unit team filmed the crew and then they had the actors come in later for the same scene, but the sun didn't match. Keep in mind, oh, like, so, something to keep in mind. I think this is actually the brightest scene in the movie. <laughs> Just, I was about to, I was talking about how bland the color, the, ah, the, there's the sun, I remember that. What the hell were you people doing in the editing room? I mean, aside from cutting obvious storyline content, but I digress. I feel like I'm watching a Zack Snyder movie with a level of dreariness infecting my screen. Inability to distinguish objects does not equal scary, guys. You can throw in as much spooky music as you want, but there comes a line where your movie becomes less of a movie and more so a 50s audio drama. I believe that line is crossed when your audience can miss your crappy jump scares if they aren't paying close enough attention to it. Yeah, cool. I, I don't know what I was Ooh. at. Ah, my heart's pumping I mean, so fast, Will. <laughs> Did you, oh, I was so scared. I, I, I think I oh, missed I was we, so scared. I think I missed what we were supposed to be scared at. Uh, yeah, me too. It was too fucking dark. Regardless, we're introduced to our characters, Katie, Ren, Hallie, and Chloe. I'm sure that you're all very excited to hear about their character traits. We have our main, Hallie. Her entire character is that she does track, and by that I mean that other characters regularly bring up that she does track as a certified IOU1 personality trait ticket from the writing team. We have Ren. Her entire character is that she makes jokes a lot, I guess. Maybe they were trying to go for a rule breaker archetype, but I'm not entirely 100% sure on that one. We have Katie. Her entire character is that she's the big sad because her dad's a drunk and she wants to get away from it all. And, um, uh, and then we have Chloe. Her entire character is that she, uh... Hmm. She has a crush on this guy, I guess. What are the differences between these three characters? Uh, the other one, the, the one on the left is super witchy. Okay. The one in the middle likes to run. I bet okay. that'll come up. Okay. Um, and she loves her sister. Oh, right, uh, yeah, she's yeah, yeah, the yeah, good yeah, girl yeah. that is just friends with these people, and the okay. black girl is just, um... <laughs> The token black girl. I, 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 mm. uh, I, no, 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 I'm not trying to be like... No, 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 no I no. know, but I'm like trying to think of like how she isn't. And I'm just like, oh. She has no... Oh. We don't know her family or nope. anything. Nope. Yep. Oh. Oh. Whoops. Oh, well. Whoops. <laughs> Stumbled on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that happened kind of naturally, yeah, too. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> I didn't even intend for that at all. This is very organic. <laughs> oh. oh, shit. <laughs> Whoops. Well, I guess that's Well, I'm going to give right. it the rest of the movie. Yep. Hopefully she gets a character trait yep. other than yep. friend. I'm sure that'll happen. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're, we, we just started it. We're, <laughs> we're only like half an hour in. <laughs> you know, the part where the characters get fleshed out. Dude, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so we have emotional connections to them as they go through the climatic events of the story. So there's emotional payoff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> Oh, well, not like that's any surprise. We're not exactly watching a character drama. So perhaps we can instead immerse ourselves in the bottomless depths of the Slenderman mythos and storyline. Who names your kid Ren? Her name is Ren. <laughs> Who names your Ren. kid Ren? Uh, With Ren. a W. Like, if, if she that's was That's like Asian. something that you name fucking, your parrot. Fucking Kylo. <laughs> Like, no, 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 Ky no, Kylo, at, le at least Kylo Ren is, like, a Sith name, right? And, like, wow. Ren, you could argue, like, for, like, real people would be, like, Asian. Fair enough. It's spelled with a fucking W. Exactly. Uh, W-R-E-N. And, and, -E and she's some fucking... And she's some fucking small-town white girl. Like, what the fuck? You named your daughter Warren. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I think you can forgive me if I skim past the awkwardly written teenage girl dialogue and skip to where things are actually getting interesting. Don't worry, though, I'll briefly bring up the setup first. You know, Black did you know that pilgrims used to think sneezing meant you were expelling demons? That's yeah. why I never sneeze. 
I want to keep them all. No, it's <laughs> my soul. Your soul. If I had one. Soul, if I had one, right? Ginger, no soul. Edgy, that's right. Yeah, this is like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's all coming Ed, back. Edgy redhead. One, edgy redhead. The one, yep, yep. the one ginger goth of every high school. <laughs> As our characters are making their way down the $15 lighting budget high school hallway, they begin making stupidly obvious foreshadowing dialogue regarding how they wish they could all remain the same age that they are now. Twitter poll. If you could stay one age forever, what would it be? Easy. 21. No way. I'd be 10. This dialogue is, uh, you can already tell this was not actually written by somebody who's ever spoken to a teenager before. Probably the first time any of these actors have ever actually been in the same room as each other, so they didn't even get a chance to see what's happening. <laughs> we then get introduced to our generic group of male friend stock characters in which we establish the different crushes that they have on one another, as well as some secret that they apparently have planned for the evening. There actually isn't any relevance to these people as we go on. That's It's merely here to kickstart the inciting incident and there we go we're skipping over the dinner scene because it's genuinely a minute and a half of nothing happening we meet hallie's sister and there's a moment to establish that they love each other you know so we can be sad when slender man starts being mean to them even though i can guarantee without a shadow of a doubt that there isn't a pair of teenage sisters on the planet that get along this well especially when one of them is telling the other no to something can i come not a chance you said i could come next time did you really think the audience was already that disconnected from the film that we needed a short, heartfelt moment to remind us that sisters love each other? Because nobody does this. Lizzie wouldn't stand there and stare lovingly after her sister before going back to the dinner that Warren interrupted. She would say bye and close the door. This is a prime example of the direct opposite of the make your horror movie characters unlikable morons trope. All you're doing is going with an equally stupid route of look how happy and wholesome the these people are. I sure hope nothing bad ever happens to them. Don't you? I sure hope this sister who's trying to emulate her older sibling doesn't try to follow her older sister's steps into the realm of evil. Don't you? God is listening from your prayer. You know what? That is my favorite shot of the entire movie so far. That actually had some stuff going on. Too bad it was two seconds. <laughs> movie, stop. God, and give me a chance to absorb this. Anyway, the group shows up to Katie's house and they all sit in the basement watching porn while Katie discusses how much she hates her life because her father is an alcoholic. She talks about how she wishes she could get away and leave forever and how she thinks she's going to be stuck living here for the rest of her life. Bitch, bitch, you're, you're, uh, Oh, my dad's such an alcoholic as you're sitting down here drinking, emulating your father. <laughs> Gee, I wonder if that's foreshadowing of anything. And as if right on cue, they begin discussing the boys from earlier, wherein Chloe reveals that she knows what their apparent secret was and that they're actually gathering together to perform a ritual to summon Slender Man. Oh my god, who's Slender Man? Oh my god, please explain to us the backstory of this random creature in great detail. <laughs> I want one-sided exposition now. <laughs> Slender Man can manifest in a variety of ways. Oh, she is. <laughs> there it is. Who is Slender Man, you may ask? Well, for those of you who were blessed with a lack of internet access back in 2012 when nobody would shut up about the damn thing, I can basically tell you that in this rendition, he is a less strict pedophile version of the Bye Bye Man. So make of that what you will. As Chloe is giving the super spooky extended version of that explanation, Katie begins searching for information on Slenderman, and within a minute, she finds the link that contains a video that supposedly summons him. And after the patented dialogue of, we should do this, no we shouldn't, yes we should, okay, our heroes all gather around and click on the obvious Trojan link. That is a good idea! What the fuck? The tab? Hold on, look at, look at what the what? address is. It looks just like an IP address. Well, oh yeah, it does. That's weird. <laughs> wow, damn. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. You know what else I see? Uh. Product placement? Where, where, where? Oh, 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 Edge. Yeah. Damn. The yeah. Slender Man is real. I know it seems weird, or maybe you think I'm crazy, but trust me, it's real. <laughs> 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 hey, look at that! Second link on the Google results. Summon him. Found the link. Why summoning him? <laughs> You're gonna end Are up you in the dark web, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> 
you have found the secret lolly porn site that is a link that it's like how many kids from the <laughs> so how, how often do you think this occurs where like people just google slender man and then they find this because it's the second result <laughs> Well, that was him that put the link there. He does. He just drops one of those links in every uh, every chat board about him. Yeah. <laughs> <He's> just, <laughs> I'm just imagining Slenderman cruising full, just posting links. This feels wrong. This feels like Russian malware virus type oh. shit. Well, yes, that that's what it is, and it's certainly too late now because you've already clicked on the link. You aren't really one to frequent the message boards of the internet, are you, Katie? You know what you do when someone posts a random ass link on a message board? You reply with this and then you move on with your day. If you've ever bought anything on this computer, your bank account has already been drained. So good job on that. Also, this is how we're bringing the movie monster in, huh? A cursed video. Interesting. I have many questions. I'd love to know how this video is relevant to Slenderman in any fashion whatsoever. The spooky forest entity that steals children and drives people insane is brought about by cursed video do not watch dot WMV. Somebody's been watching the ring, haven't they? Watch this tutorial on how to summon him. <laughs> Hey guys, what up? It's your boy, Summoning Demons 111. <laughs> Today we're going to summon Slenderman, but first I need you to hit that like button, that subscribe, and ring the bell! Called Slenderman at 3 a.m. and he answered. <laughs> God, sexual! <laughs> Except I don't even think that's an entirely fair comparison. At least in the ring, there's somewhat of a half-assed attempt at explaining the existence of the tape. The implication being that Samara cursed and essentially channeled her rage into one of the VHSs that was brought in once the inn was built over her death spot. Considering that's where the tape was when Rachel went there, I don't think it's too unreasonable to say that she cursed a VHS. It ain't perfect, but at least I can see those details if I look and think to myself, okay... They don't explicitly say, but I can reasonably assume this because it's the most logical conclusion. Here we're basically just injecting the plot into our arms with a heroin needle with the casual shrug of, I don't know, evil, spooky, Illuminati triangles. Well, it took one bitch having a rosary, but nah, Catholicism <laughs> bad. <laughs> Where did this video even come from? All we see is that it's posted by crazy mental asylum person who certainly wouldn't have had access to the editing software needed to put this together. Nor do I believe she would have the ability to acquire this drone footage. Damn it, weed or broccoli? <laughs> <What is this? laughs> and that's not even getting into the fact that she shouldn't even have internet access, but that's something we'll get into later. Speaking of, however, my god, does this video have some damn high production value for a spooky cursed summoning ritual. That wasn't half this isn't half bad cinematography, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right, it's a, a, a demon summoning ritual. Some pretty good HD footage of like drone shots and all that. Yeah, the second unit director probably did a pretty decent job. <laughs> Why exactly did you people throw your entire budget into the Slenderman summoning video instead of the Slenderman movie? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that it can't be the case that it would be of this high quality, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't take me a bit off guard. What with the aforementioned drone footage, forest scenery that was clearly shot in high definition, scrolling text with in-depth instructions and transition effects. I would have thought that the process for summoning a child-stealing forest demon would have been a little bit more on the raw side and less professionally edited. Wait, has this ever been a thing with Slenderman is summoning him? <laughs> no. I've never even heard of this. Like, you couldn't uh, even stay consistent with Slenderman. <laughs> That's an adaptation argument, Evan. <laughs> yes, I think this is a bad adaptation of Slenderman, okay? Do something about it. <laughs> Man, Bells. who the hell edited this footage together? <laughs> I don't know. Also, at least in Samara's video, it was relevant to her abysmal life for the most part. I mean, yeah, it, it had creepy weird crap in it too, because, oh, scary visuals. But there was at least somewhat of a story being told throughout. Most of the shots in the video detailed events, places, or people that were prominent in Samara's life and death. Here, the writers didn't have anything for Slender Man outside of the video game or whatever Marble Hornets videos they skimmed through prior to pre-production. What's relevant to Slender Man? Trees, 
Okay, put some branches in one of the Illuminati triangles. They're 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 spamming like like zoomed in microscope shit. Yeah, like because it looks ooh creepy. <laughs> Interspersed with Illuminati triangles <laughs> and like goat fur and and horns. And they're just like oh demon stuff. God, don't have babies. I feel like Alex Jones right now. That's what they're doing though. <laughs> But regardless of all of that, this doesn't even seem to fit Slenderman's M.O. in this movie. There weren't really a lot of points where I'm thinking to myself, Oh yeah, I can see this guy cursing a YouTube video. He kind of just seems content to mess with people's sanity or just stand there menacingly in the distance. His range of influence seems to only extend to those on his grocery list and strikes more as one who would target his victims selectively rather than arbitrarily. I say this mainly because the movie really pushes that he prefers to go after kids. There's a direct Pied Piper comparison at one point. How did Slender Man target his victims before the internet existed? Because our little obligatory research scene here shows us that he's been bothering people for quite some time. Did the appearance of the video just make him lazier? Are we to assume that these recent disappearances are because they all watched the Slender Man summoning ritual and before that he was just a little more proactive in his motivations? Are you telling me that these two little girls who are barely above the label of toddler watched the Slender Man summoning video on 4chan and they were able to clear their minds as per the video's instructions? Hey, so check this out. They hmm. couldn't sl summon Slender Man. I bet not one of those bitches is capable of actually clearing their minds at this point in time in their lives. <laughs> yeah. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> like, they wrote a whole Harry Potter book about how he couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, she looks like her mind's clear. Definitely, yeah. The now more frequent abductions increase scientists' interest in Slender Man mythology. Did none of these scientists know about the video? What happens when an adult watches it? Do they still go crazy? Or do they just not watch it? Are we to say that these scientists and other investigators who have admitted that the disappearances of these kids are at the very least connected to the mythos of Slender Man would come to the ultimate conclusion of nah, and then completely disregard a supposed Slender Man summoning video that would reasonably be in the history tab of most of these missing kids' browsers? I'd say that'd be worth a footnote, if nothing else. Reasonably enough, it's not too far-fetched to say that they would immediately see this and think, oh, someone is potentially using the disguise of an internet legend to cover up their kidnapping and possible murder of children. We should look into this. But no, realistically, this is, this is a malware link, and all you've summoned is some degenerate who is now watching you through your webcam. So congratulations on that. You morons are now on par with the old people who absolutely believe that their new boyfriend slash girlfriend needs another $1,500 worth of Bed Bath & Beyond gift cards in order to afford their plane ticket to America. <laughs> oh, it fucked up with their other MK Ultra stuff. <laughs> When you try to load like software like twice. Is he on the iOS for version twelve? Watch a movie. Nah, no, 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 no. The Mac version. I think he's out. trying to be. Oh, yeah. gotcha. <laughs> It's like that thing where you know he's a Samsung's kinda, guy. I get it. You kind of have to it. like struggle with like, do we do we release on Linux or Mac first? You know, like obviously mm -hmm. like go for yeah. Mac, but Linux like gets you the indie crowd too, which is kind of more the Slender Man crowd to begin with. Yeah, sure. the fucking hipsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys should get a Linux. Like you can program <laughs> it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but Slender Man is our official sponsor for Linux. Right? It's, like, it's actually a lot more reliable than iMac, actually. What is this stupid video? I, I agree with you guys. That was pretty stupid. I, I've never heard of that in terms of Slender Man. And <laughs> what, at least in The Ring, it's like an actual tape. It's like something that is like specific. <laughs> like, did they just really get that off of some random website? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> but after this, we fast forward a week from this point after we get some weird abstract nightmare sequence from Hallie. I feel I really shouldn't have to go over it because the greater majority of it is completely meaningless to the story. But the unfortunate truth that lies before us is that these kinds of sequences are actually a rather large portion of the film. Like, 
substantially. Almost like the movie wasn't actually long enough to hit the hour and a half feature length duration and they needed to do some things to pad out the runtime. Certainly makes one wonder if this was because the studio panic cut some of the story because of the fear of public response to it, such as a certain character death or even just an entirely different character. Nah, I'm sure that couldn't possibly be it. Regardless, I deeply apologize for any substantial plot points you may miss as a result of me not going over the Hallie face-melting effect and the evil pregnancy bits. I'm, sh I'm sure they were indispensable to the narrative. Instead, let's talk about the fact that the school decided that a graveyard was the best place they could take their students to on a field trip. I'm not sure if that's a testament to how crappy of a school this is or how crappy of a town this is. Either way, though, it's intriguing to point out because a couple things are starting to become rather clear now. That being, my god, no wonder all of these kids are trying to summon demons in their basements. Apparently that's the most interesting thing you can do here aside from drugs. Man, they don't even care about the teacher. I can't even hear <laughs> Yeah, I want to know what he's saying, because what, what could have prompted a fucking school field trip to a graveyard? <laughs> Right? <laughs> anyway, we get our sledgehammer to the face setup that Hallie and Tom have crushes on each other. Did you see the setup? That they, oh. they like each other. Oh. That's, that's gonna get a payoff later. Oh. <laughs> Before we cut to our characters talking among themselves of the upcoming events. Oh hey, look at that. Your edgy redhead friend is suddenly acting really weird and staring off into space while lagging behind the rest of your group. This is coming right off the heels of you talking about how you've all been having nightmares about the Slenderman video because apparently you haven't talked about it at all before this point. An entire week has gone by but but you're just now deciding to discuss your nightmares from it. Bit weird, but we'll roll with it. Evidently, this also extends to how much awareness you have on Katie's obvious decline in rational behavior. As the movie progresses, we get a couple snippets of info on what Katie's been up to during this week, and it isn't exactly what one would call the actions of a sane individual. What with her hyperventilation-filled selfie stick recorded midnight strolls into the wilderness, as well as her DMs with mental asylum patients, one would imagine that her BFF would pick up on the fact that something was amiss, especially considering that she's been acting off since the second that the video ended. And if we're pairing this with the fact that the other girls were also feeling a bit off since watching the video, I guess, maybe, even though they aren't talking about it with one another for whatever reason, they're absolutely going to be even more likely to notice subtle shifts in personality with the rest of their friends, doubly so for the one who's already the big sad about her alcoholic father. I don't care if she was trying to hide it from them. With all the things I just mentioned, it wouldn't exactly take the world's greatest detective to realize, oh, Something's wrong with my friend. This isn't necessarily a supernatural event, but there's clearly some kind of underlying issue happening. With my friend. I should try to reach out beyond a passing comment and try to help in any way possible. Because she's my friend. How do you suppose our heroes decide they're going to handle Katie's obvious decline into dementia-ridden madness? Hey, Katie? Katie, you okay? Yes. <laughs> no need to follow that up. I'll just walk away from you now. Okay, All right, have just fun. leave her alone. Yeah, we're just gonna walk. Yeah, come Stare on. at the trees. I'm gonna keep going on our our graveyard field trip. Bye, Katie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Oh wow, that's a uh, wow. What an asshole thing to do. Hallie asks if she's okay once, and when she absentmindedly replies yes in a way that almost makes it look like she didn't even listen to the question, they turn around and keep walking, even after looking back to see that she's full on stopped and is now blankly staring off into the woods. Observation isn't really your strong suit, is it? Not gonna walk up to your friend and try to comfort her at all, or ask what's going on, or... Anything. Tell a teacher something is wrong, maybe. I'm sure your fellow classmates will forgive you for interrupting the cemetery field trip. But of course not. Then the movie would have to come up with another way to make Katie disappear all dramatic-like, so we can't be having any of that. Chloe even pulls Hallie away as if to say to her, No, 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 don't do anything else. This is a plot point. We're like, what? 13 minutes into this movie right now? Yeah, we don't have time for friends to act caring towards each other. We've already expended the CGI budget on all the weird crap we're about to dump onto the screen, and we're certainly not going to just not use it. Is this really gonna be the entire movie? Is it just gonna be cutting back and forth between shots of the sky and the gate and the woods? 
That's not, not how horror, horror works. <laughs> I guess the school officials waited until nightfall to decide to actually call the police about the missing kid. Up to that point, they've just been hanging out, I suppose, letting other classmates text and leave messages on her phone all day. D do, you, do you suppose we should involve the authorities yet, Mr. Teacher Man? It's been four hours since we last saw her. Nah, give it another hour. She'll be back. Shake the food bowl harder. Yo, like, why wouldn't they be here before, though? <laughs> like, it's a missing child. Like, why wouldn't they be here like, before, though? Immediately. And they're like, yeah. what? Why are the cops here? Like, there's a missing <laughs> child. What the fuck are you talking about? Why weren't you here three hours ago? <laughs> God damn it. Like, you, you'd think that, like, the, like, the first... 30 minutes of realizing that she's gone, mm -hmm. it would be like, oh no. Yeah. 911. That one. <laughs> Immediately. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't have waited until night. <laughs> yeah, I'm blown away by like, like, because they were at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. They so, were at school. So pre so, three o'clock? So they probably went on, go on field trips in the morning. Yeah. So they can have lunch or something so they can be back in time for school to let out. <laughs> it's an all day field trip. If it's dark, then that means that. Uh, where do you do we know where they are? Doesn't matter. Uh, let's say it's school time. <laughs> so realistically, it gets dark around seven thirty. So it's like four and a half unaccounted for, at least. Yeah. Four and a half unaccounted for hours. Yep. While they're just like, ooh, this fucking bitch just ran off. <laughs> And the cops show, what the fuck cops here? What are they going to the woods for? They leave my friend alone. That's yep. a big gap of time. That is, that is. That's a huge gap of time. Man. Even if, like, you're in school in Alaska, it's yeah. still, like, three hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is so dead. <laughs> God, she's in a different Man, state. Yeah. <laughs> there's zero hope. If she was kidnapped, that bitch is gone. Yeah. There's hope it's a supernatural entity that just ripped her non existent soul out of her body. And, and not and not a human trafficker like, as it would be in our horrific reality. Yeah. Let's hope that it's just Slender Man. The demon is retard summoned. Good movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the yeah they'd here. send the kids home by this point. They'd still be looking for her, but they wouldn't delay the class till that what it yeah. was like dusk a second ago. No, it's just midnight. There's, hey, it, it, it... <laughs> A kid has gone missing, and there's a, there's a possibility that there's a kidnapper in the area. Let's keep all the other kids yeah, here. <laughs> that makes what? perfect sense. Anyway, let's look at my favorite horror trope in the world now. Police idiocy. As we move into the next scene, we see Hallie sitting on her bed watching a news broadcast wherein the reporter mentions that friends and family have been questioned regarding Katie's disappearance. So if we are to assume that the police did the logical thing of immediately figuring out who the last people were who saw Katie before her disappearance, as well as figuring that Katie's friends are actually upset about the fact that their super close friend is missing, we're all prisoners because of you. Then we can also reasonably assume that they're going to at least be relatively truthful with the police and say yeah she yeah she was acting kind of weird before and she was kind of staring off into the woods was she acting weird before you ask oh I'm not sure I don't actually pay attention to my best friend's behavior at any given time reasonably enough the police would then assume well something was clearly going on before this happened what should we do next oh yeah let's go look in her bedroom oh wow there's a bunch of creepy drawings of something called slender man littering the place along with a bunch of baphomet cult books what's slender man i better look that up oh it's a legend that has to do with missing children wow that doesn't sound like something that could be used as a cover for a human trafficking operation or anything we better find her laptop immediately and try to determine who she's been talking with and what kind of websites she's been going to so that we can hopefully track her down before it's too late What's that you say? Laptops not immediately in sight? Well, 
time to have launched an immediate in-depth search of this bedroom and subsequently the house until we find it. Better start questioning the father and possibly the friends again so that we can ask if there's any hiding spots that she would put something that she wouldn't want other people to find. Hmm. In-depth searches do entail quite a bit of work though, don't they? Well, case has gone cold, everyone. Yeah, no, they're, no, not gonna, no. they're not going to search the whole They room. didn't have a Come warrant on. for the closet. <laughs> so how fantastic is that? Had the police decided that they actually would have looked for the missing child, it sure as hell would have been a lot more difficult for Hallie and Chloe to find the laptop later on so that we can lead up to seeing what the CGI budget was spent on. In the meantime, enjoy some character building. Remember she was complaining about headaches in class? Yeah, where the hell is she? So messed up. I got the flyers printed up. Can we start posting? Sorry, we can start posting. It's all irrelevant because they're posting it in the school, Will. <laughs> cool, I'll also post to Facebook. She's gonna come back. She has to. I miss her so much. We are friends. We talk to each other. <laughs> We text each other. We definitely know each other. These definitely aren't two pedophiles making posts together and, not, and, and pretending to be children. This fucking... If I didn't know this was a movie, I'd be like, that's a fucking honeypot. Yeah. <laughs> How Shakespearean. You should tell me what really happened to Katie. We never keep secrets from each other. My friends and I may or may not have summoned a demon last week. We clicked the link that said, <laughs> that said Hillary's email, so, you know. Every one of these movies is just has to be written by some fucking massive shut-in who's never spoken to another human being in their entire life. Unfortunately, we have no time to continue this heartfelt discussion between siblings, as Hallie and Lizzie hear a mysterious sound from downstairs. Hallie calls out for her parents and gets no response. In fact, in place of that response, she gets an even louder bang from downstairs, confirming to the two girls that someone is in their house. So, parents aren't home then, I guess. That's a bit odd. Leaving your two children by themselves in the late evening hours after one of their friends just disappeared. Does doesn't really seem like the appropriate time for date night because the parents absolutely would have heard these noises happening at the same time Hallie and Lizzie are and dad would be grabbing the shotgun. Unless we're going to be saying that Slenderman is messing with them and only they can hear this, which, spoiler alert, that's not what's happening. So let's just keep that little bundle of idiocy in mind. These parents are absolutely, without a doubt, not home right now. Well, or they just heard it while they were watching NCIS in the bedroom and said to each other, meh. Nah. Our teenage daughter will handle it. Which is immediately what Hallie takes it upon herself to do. Allow me to leave you by yourself <laughs> during the potential home invasion. <laughs> I'm gonna go fight him <laughs> off. Rather than quietly locking the door because of a potential breaking and entering situation, or calling someone on the phone she was just using, she decides she's gonna flip off the old survival instinct and select horror movie protagonist default decision 12. As she leaves her younger sister by herself and starts towards the noise, firmly ensuring that every single light source in the house remains out. Bravo, Hallie. This game-changing stratagem came about the same night that one of your best friends just vanished into thin air. Not like this would be on the forefront of your mind or anything. You think Callie's gonna turn on a light? No, yeah. that's all spooky. <laughs> no, no, people people can't do things that make sense in horror movies. No. They yeah, because be no, that's so unfucking unrealistic. It's fucking daylight well, people, out. When they're by it's themselves. It's fucking daylight out. That was a when window. People, yes, when it's people are by Holy themselves shit. at home. <laughs> it, oh my God. Oh my God. Fucking daylight. They couldn't even fucking put up like a black curtain or fucking anything. Nice. It's like they, nice. they fucking shot this during the fucking daytime. <laughs> they're like, yeah, just turn off all, all the lights. No. No, it's the know. light from the moon. It's the light from the moon, Dan. What yeah, well, are you, well, some how, kind of glow moon? Why Jesus. is the light from the moon like bright white? <laughs> because the because the moon is not ninety is not two hundred thousand miles away. Gosh, forget yeah. Slender Man. This is uh, Illuminate Man. Also, yeah, I was, <sighs> yeah, I was just saying like when people are by themselves. In that window. <laughs> I'll, you know. Yeah, it's because it's on the other side, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the light is the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, mm-hmm. when people are also when people are by themselves at home when they're like really fucking scared and they think there's someone there, <laughs> they will definitely walk into the darkness. Look at that. There's mm-hmm. light shining yeah. onto her back, but then it's dark on the other side through the other window. Well, you know. It's... Yeah. <laughs> all right, look, look, look. All right, they have some really it's, uh... bright porch lights. All right? Yeah, it's a street yeah, light. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Shut up, they nitpicker. Got... <laughs> Be scared. Yeah, it doesn't be. It's it's not a flaw. That, yeah, yeah, be scared. Yeah, it's spooky. It's dark. They're casual spot. Just pretend it's what you want in the okay? window. Maybe turn on a light. Like, what are you doing? This isn't even just for you. This is for me. I can't see what the hell is going on. I can vaguely make out the shape of a human being walking. So I can certainly say that you can't see anything that's going on either. With that in mind, what exactly is your plan when you come across the knife wielding crackhead hiding behind your couch? Wait, I didn't see anything. Hell am I looking at? Oh, there it is. Cool. I'm sufficiently spooked now. Good job, movie. I had to rewind and look for your jump scare because it was too goddamn dark to see anything. That's pretty incredible. Wait for it. Did you get scared, Jess? Were, were you terrified? Did you get did you get to spooky? You're never gonna sleep again, I'll bet. <laughs> oh, she's scared. Oh, a shadow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did there was go? a little shadow. Yeah, there was, there was a shadow. It moved. It moved. And they went <laughs> on the music, yeah. so she ran away. Yeah, I heard the music. I didn't see the damn yep. shadow. Yeah, yeah, yep. hold on, hold on. Yeah, it's important. You need to see the jump scare. Yeah, yeah, see, see? Watch. <laughs> see it that time? <laughs> <laughs> it took me like five times too. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. One more time. One more time. Okay. Do that time. <laughs> what I mistook for the mirror was the top part of the damn window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you spooked? No. Oh. <laughs> also, yeah. There was somebody downstairs. Not exactly sure what you were expecting there, Hallie. I can't even see anything. I did. Oh no. Did you see Wait, the jump scare? I, I couldn't even see that. What Was it a face? You wanna pull it back? No. <laughs> <laughs> so she rushes back upstairs to her bedroom and locks the door, like how she should have done in the first place. Then her and Lizzie huddle together for a bit as they begin hearing footsteps approaching from the other side. The doorknob begins rattling, and Hallie shouts that she's calling the police. Bravo once again, Hallie. Took you long enough, but you finally realize, oh, I shouldn't go towards weird noises in the dark that don't reply to me. I'm sure that you'll use this knowledge prominently in your impending battle against the supernatural demon that you summoned. But fear not, because in this instance it turns out it's just Katie's drunken father who picked the absolutely perfect narrative moment to reveal his identity to the girls. Katie? Apparently he didn't feel the need to call out for Katie at all while he was banging around down in the living room, nor did he feel the need to acknowledge the voice of a girl calling out for her parents, or even the appearance of a girl investigating the noises that he had been making. No. Absolute silence this whole time, other than whatever creepy noises that needed to happen to get her attention in the first place. He also didn't feel the need to say anything as he proceeded to startle her and follow her up the stairs, continuing his vow of silence all the way up there until he'd rattled the doorknob enough times to make him decide to call out for his daughter. All the while, the two girls inside of the room he's trying to get into are screaming in absolute horror and threatening him with the police. But I, I guess he's drunk, so he just missed all of that. So anyway, Hallie, about those police you're calling. I see you've hung up now that you know that it's just Katie's drunken father who's broken into your house. Not that it matters anyway, because the police are going to be on their way at this point regardless. But you do realize that there's still a drunk man that broke into your house, right? Oh, you're going to open the door, huh? For the guy who is sneaking around in the darkness downstairs and violently rattling your door to get inside. That is a good idea! I'm sure he has nothing but benevolent intentions for you. 
<laughs> Why is he looking the other way? <laughs> so he could dramatically turn. <laughs> hey, look at that. He almost immediately devolves into drunken rage and begins drilling you about where his daughter is. How could you have ever guessed that would happen? Where is she? No, don't help me. Where is my daughter? Where is she? Let's go. I'm sorry, what? Oh my, what? Yeah, no. Hey, By the way, that done. dude would have, like, 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 it would be horrific, mm. but almost comedic. The, <laughs> <laughs> how easily, doesn't matter how drunk this dude is, how easily this dude could yeah, have yeah. whipped both of those girls' asses. Just soundlessly. Yeah. Just, mm. just. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and both of them would have fallen down. Like, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> They're children. <laughs> I mean, I can't even say I know exactly what happened here. Because one, this family decided to light their house with jars of fireflies. And two, the editing is so abhorrent that it begins to look like Taken 3 for a moment. Every time I think I'm getting a grasp of what's actually happening, it cuts to a new shot. I'm left to assume that Hallie has telekinesis that she never uses again at any point going forward, because otherwise I have no explanation on how this 15-year-old girl managed to overpower and shove away this grown-ass man that decided he wanted to attack them. How, how did how did she push him off of her? <laughs> and then he just tiny. cut away. What did, oh, and now, now the, hey. the cops are... <laughs> and then just, just cut to him being hauled away in the cop car. Yeah. The editing in this movie is exceptionally bad. That <laughs> so many cutting back and forth, and at the same time, so much cut out. I oh, hey, look, Allie's parents decided to show up. Hell Where the you fuck were you? <laughs> uh, Shitty parents. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, You're getting Tanazak. <laughs> <laughs> but oh well i guess we can say the creepy guy was nabbed right i'm sure we won't be seeing him again in any scenes moving forward let's carry happily along to the next scene shall we after we see hallie giving out a bunch of missing posters to a school full of people who are already aware of katie's disappearance we get a nice little scene where our group discusses recent events and on top of that we're gifted with some of the most beautiful adr i've ever seen Katie's father broke into my house last night. As the conversation goes on, Warren brings up the video and how it affected all of them. And this, she believes, is the reason why Katie disappeared. I don't want to play this game. It's not a game. Katie's missing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not a game. Katie's missing. <laughs> Joey, I loved you in Fargo. And nothing else. I, you were that kid in that movie. And now you became that teenager in that movie. So that's interesting. So you've come to the conclusion of supernatural being before you came to the conclusion of kidnapper. Keep in mind, this is based entirely around the fact that she was spooked by a video that looks like it was put together by some edgy goth kid. I mean, I guess I'll be fair, though. She was really spooked. She had a couple nightmares about it, as indicated by her bringing it up as if it were a minor annoyance to her otherwise neutral school week. Clearly, she didn't actually notice or pick up on the fact that there was anything going on with her other friends. We're all prisoners because of you. But now I suppose we're to say that this was a terrible looming storm cloud that's been hanging over them this whole time that they never once discussed or notice with one another. But never mind that. Clearly Slenderman is the only explanation for Katie's disappearance. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it couldn't just be a creep in the fucking woods. No, no, no. Nah, those people they don't. Felt those that's, people don't exist. They felt something, that's not, damn. <laughs> that's not realistic, yeah. What is the plan for our daring trio, you may ask? Well, clearly a mystery is afoot, and since the police stopped existing last scene, our group of morons conclude that they have to take the investigation into their own hands, and so they head off to Katie's house where... What? What the hell are you doing here? Wait, did he get arrested or not? Yeah, yeah, he was arrested. Yeah, he's out. Oh, they, they, what did they, did yeah, they yeah, throw he, him into the drunk tank and let him go this na same day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he assaulted her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. He, he broke into their house and assaulted them. That would yeah. not just be a, a, like, sleep it off and then you're done. How? I, how? <laughs> 
<laughs> Unless this is a different father, mm-hmm. and I'm super confused. Mm-hmm. Bitch got two dads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're twins. <laughs> oh god I'm the, yeah. this is the only way that it makes <laughs> rational sense will is incestuous twin fathers yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> literally the only way that it makes sense oh god so okay so let's see here breaking and entering public intoxication and two charges of assault on a minor you're telling me this man isn't in prison right now. Do you even believe that movie? Did you forget what happened in the last scene? Because that's pretty substantial. My God, movie, did you actually forget that you had him arrested in the last scene? You don't realize how he was last night. Oh, so you didn't forget. Wow. Either that or the editors realized it when they got to the scene and immediately went, Holy fucking shit! And threw in a quick ADR line from Julia to try and band-aid it up. Unless we're to say that Slenderman world has different laws than what we have, then sure. But that also brings up a couple extra problems. Not. That is, like, even if it's not a problem with the law, right? Mm-hmm. It is a problem with the morality of the people in this fucking world. Mm-hmm. The undoing of reality through the disregard of specific laws is entirely dependent on the context in which that law is disregarded. The impact on the reality determines how important a flaw or lack thereof is to the narrative. Because if we are to say in Slenderman world you can drunkenly beat up children in their own bedrooms and be out of prison the very next day, then society as a whole has already crumbled. So yeah. The fact that this guy is out of prison is stupid. So the three walk up to the house where they see that Katie's dad is passed out and asleep on his couch. I suppose he had a few extra bucks laying around after paying his own bail, so he bought some more alcohol in celebration. Works out pretty well, too, because now they have basically unlimited access to the house, so long as they are marginally quieter than he was. Too bad Ren's an idiot and decided to ring the doorbell to wake him up so that she could then distract him while Hallie and Chloe sneak around behind him. I guess forethought is isn't really a prevalent process that goes on in the minds of Hallie, Chloe, and Warren here, huh? Rather than leaving the violent drunk man asleep so that they can get in and out as quickly as possible, they instead decided the superior plan was to have him wake up while they were rummaging around in his missing daughter's bedroom. Do you suppose that in the event that he heard any kind of noise coming from her room that he would perhaps want to investigate and see if his missing daughter had come back? How do you suppose he would react when he found that it wasn't her, given his previous interactions with you? Where is she? (laughs) Punches her in the face. (laughs) But I mean, if we're going that far... Hey Warren, what exactly were you planning on doing if Frank Costanza here decided to attack you too? Or even just not invite you into the house because he doesn't actually have a reason to? Then your friends are alone in the house with him with nothing to distract him from wandering into her room for whatever reason, since he's grieving the disappearance of his daughter. If you aren't picking up on my subtlety, Warren, you made a very stupid decision. Don't worry though, I'm sure it'll be your last one. Police must have taken her laptop. Oh, contraire, Chloe. Little do you know, the police have already forgotten about Katie. You know, I've been watching that show the 48 hours, and the most important thing to learn is the reason that the 48 hours are so critical is because after that, they just give up. (laughs) (laughs) They just stop trying. They're like, what? That shit happened on Monday. It's Wednesday. We're on new shit now. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if they never even came here to begin with because nothing looks like it was confiscated. And if the movie is trying to tell me that they did take stuff, then they took all of the wrong stuff. There is absolutely nothing in this room that is a bigger piece of evidence than all of the obvious demon crap that is littering her desk right now. (laughs) There was a drawing of a little girl being friends with a tree. That's so sweet. Good thing the police just decided they weren't going to continue the investigation what's so goddamn ever, so our little gaggle of budding detectives could see all of this and then look in the obvious covered up crawl space in the closet where the laptop was. And so, after somehow managing to sneak back out of Katie's house without her dad noticing, our little detective Cluso interns take the laptop back to Chloe's place. I'll be damned, we saw her dad. Oh my gosh. Yep. <laughs> Backstory. <laughs> 
she has a dad. She was a baby at one point. <laughs> Wherein they proceed to go through her browser history and find a strange website with a list of dated links documented throughout. Staying consistent with their level of intellect in regard to clicking links on shady ass websites, they proceed to start randomly clicking around the screen to their heart's fancy. That is a good one. Man. Imagine thinking this is safe. And look at this crap. Would you be clicking on these links? Anybody with 20 minutes of computer experience who went to a website and saw this pop up would be like, holy shit, and would immediately unplug their computer. On the other hand, maybe I actually just have way too much faith left in my fellow man to be able to determine this. Sometimes it's admittingly hard to differentiate. How do you suppose these girls react when they get pop ups telling them to claim their prize because they're the millionth viewer? Also, while we're on the topic let's take a look at these file sizes 1.92 gigs like goddamn that's god long damn. that's a long video if, if that if that's in 720 that's still like a that's a four hour video if it's in 4k <laughs> it's still a, a like a 50 minute video like what the what the fuck could possibly be on for that long when all you're saying like, ah! Man, there's a lot buried in the background on that. Man, right. you clicking those things, you're getting some viruses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're downloading an entity. Oh! <laughs> hey, look, Ren. This one's called Slenderman Sighting Near Your Location.exe. Why don't you get that downloading next? Oh, no. Yeah, all of these Why links. does she have videos of random children <laughs> on a I mean, yeah, look, look at this absolutely real, genuine, like... Yeah, real. Yeah. real. Oh, my God, that stock sound. <laughs> <laughs> real Slender Man sighting. Oh, Come my God, tape. Red Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh Is my that, god! It was a did fucking you, did, YouTube. It was a fucking YouTube thumbnail. <laughs> did, 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 did you did did you see the way he was like like? Do you do you see? Through? Do you see? <laughs> I circled it. Top fifteen scary Slender Man sightings. <laughs> Number nine oh will god, shock I you. <laughs> I want I want to smash that guy's face. I swear to God. Now, 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 make sure to hit the like and subscribe. Or in this, Man. in this video, <laughs> two little oh. girls are walking oh with God. their mother. <laughs> I fucking hate that guy. God damn it! <laughs> <sighs> They're laughing yes, and playing, <laughs> and then in the distance, you can see the Slender Man in the distance. <laughs> Now make sure to like uh, and subscribe, or the I, Slender Man will come into your house and steal did, all your milk. Did you see it? I will put it in slow motion so you can see. Man, that was spooky. Oh my god! I wasn't. I honestly wasn't expecting the red circle in there. Like, hey, you, look, you, there it is. You literally just made me is. break out in sweats, Tom. Please stop. <laughs> I'm like sweating now. I know it was really very spooky. Angry. It's like it was it was really sp it was spooky when I couldn't see the red circle, but when they had the red circle was in, it pointed oh, it out to me. I was just like, oh, oh man, oh fuck this movie. It's him. Imagine thinking that's real. <laughs> After this, they bring up a chat log she apparently had with the mysterious Alley Cat 93. Who is Alley Cat 93, you may ask? Well, I, I don't know. Because she was cut from the film. This chat box is the last remnant of her character that's left. Presumably because there's no way they could have removed this and even hope to have this Frankenstein story be even slightly coherent. It would be a lot better if, like, they actually <laughs> met her. I, I don't know. I'm guessing this is either the Slender Man or some sort of, like, person with, like, a, a map in their room and, like, red yarn connecting everything. Like, <laughs> oh, which I mean... could be interesting. I'd prefer the latter, but, like, it just... Well, the, I, I mean, don't know. I can tell you right now, this was like, like that person that she was talking to online. That was a character that was in this movie. She was cut from the film. She, her entire presence. Wait, are you serious? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And she they was, cut. <sighs> they cut her entire. Why did they cut her? I, I'm guessing it was because of the, um, the 2014 stabbing crap. I'm guessing that's why. Because I, I can't think of anything. But, but wasn't this movie reason. released in like 2017? 2018. But yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> because of the 2014 yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, I do. When, I, I can't think of anything else. When was the script else. for this movie written, though? I not sure actually. Like this wasn't like blacklisted, right? No, no. It's just I know it okay. went through production hell though, because yeah, because yeah. people wanted to get this type of movie off the ground for a while. But I'm guessing the script wasn't in development that long. So if we're to work off of what we have, I can basically tell you that Alley Cat ninety three is a girl named Allison who is currently residing in the local insane asylum. Her character basically fits the crappy oracle role. She's relegated to saying creepy, mysterious things to our characters, which leads them to whatever they have to do to get us to the next jump scare we won't be able to see more often than not her responses just straight up make no sense whatsoever and it makes it look like the characters are having two different conversations and that's about it she's the slender man exposition contributor for like one scene. Now then, let's backtrack a bit to the first thing I said. As we move forward through the movie, the pre-finale bits give us a little bit of extra flavor for our little slender man encyclopedia. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, no, wow. Gotta, all right, all right, you. all right. You bring that window back to me right now so I can all say right. why it's stupid. All right, all right. So. Why <laughs> is this what thing, is this? which is the database apparently of this patient thing, yeah, yeah, in bro- a Windows local command box? <laughs> <drops? laughs> Somebody literally was like, how do we do this? Oh, I'll just, I know how to hit Microsoft R. I'll do, I'm going to type this out. What is that? Man, that's I'm impressive. I'm so mad. I'm so frustrated looking at this. Also, yeah, to navigate, use the arrow keys. Why am I navigating this command prompt with, the, with my arrow keys? Hello? Hell this is literally this? Like, what? <laughs> that's the thing. This is literally, according to this, this is on this computer's C drive. So you're telling me that this database is some chat server database for the <laughs> mental patient is on this local hard drive? <laughs> yes. That's... One more complaint I have. What the fuck is this font with the eyes? Look at the eyes. Uh, yeah, that was bothering me too. Yeah, wow, wow, yeah. Damn. It's like, it's like, shitty italic what is that should we look back on her instant messages at all no 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 i don't wanna that just made me unreasonably upset and i don't want anything more to do with it do you even realize how many questions this brings up to start i guess allison being a psychiatric patient has unmonitored internet access that seems like it could be a bit of a conflict in the healing process keep in mind this isn't just some instant messaging program allison is using here this is a chat feature on the real slender man caught on tape not fake website i talked to her who Alley Cat 93. You went back on that website? Meaning that this hospital is absolutely not monitoring what their patient is doing. Either that or we're operating from the theory that the girl who was institutionalized for thinking that Slender Man is stalking her is A-OK Greenlight approved to go visit the Slender Man cult website in between her doses of antipsychotics. Or it's this. Regardless of that likely scenario, the unfortunate reality is that there's more evidence to support that than the former, as we'll go into momentarily. But do you suppose that any of those doctors went and looked at her message history after she disappeared, wherein they would find her chats with Katie and say, Oh wow, look at that, she was talking extensively with this other girl who recently disappeared. I wonder if we should give these chat logs to the police. (laughs) But that's not even where this lunacy ends. How the hell does Warren have access to this information? Guess she just casually hacked into the institution's patient records from her command prompt. This is stupid. Then once she got in, the only information the hospital decided was relevant to the document was her name, patient number, and the username she was using. The hospital had nothing else to note about this girl. Weight, height, personality traits, medical and psychiatric reports. Nope, the doctors just need to know what she was called on the forum boards that she frequents. Which also means that they did know about the website she was going to and allowed it to continue. That is insane. Why don't you try going to Pornhub on a library computer and see what would happen from it? I'd be curious to see what the check-in to release statistics are for this institution. I bet they're pretty funny. But anyway, let's try and get ourselves back on track here. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, right, but okay, before okay. this frame gets un- unpaused, right. this is what the film does all right. The shadow in the background yeah, of I'm him just watching them. At that. Like, 
shit like that, the subtlety, this film could be good for shit like that. As I'm about to press play, you're going to see they're going to ruin it. Oh. Well, what, what did you see? I don't know. I, I don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> Nani? <Nardy? laughs> <laughs> All I see is like Asian question mark explanation points as he's like, they're looking at me? Nani? <laughs> then uh, it's over. <laughs> but yeah, if they would have just like kept that yeah. shadow, shill, uh, shadow still, yep. then that would have been really just good. Watch yep. it. Yeah. But yep. nope. Yep. Nope. 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 Like, they the audience might miss it, Zach. No. <laughs> Damn, I tried. I tried to give this fucking movie a compliment. After Warren takes the laptop back to her house, she logs on and proceeds to start talking to Allison. The thing she knows Katie's password. <laughs> I know all my friends' passwords of their personal computer. <laughs> picture of themselves mm. as their background very suspicious along with that homework folder <laughs> <laughs> the conversation is nearly coherent as she proceeds to start asking the random stranger on the internet about how they can get their friend back after the potential human trafficker proceeds to say to her that her and her friends need to go out into the woods in the middle of the night and blindfold themselves she basically responds with that is a good idea and immediately goes to pitch the idea to her other friends okay Katie asked Slenderman to take her. Yes. Why would she do that? Gee, I wonder. It's not like this is the only goddamn character trait that the writers stuffed down our throats about this idiot. Sometimes I wish I could just leave. I sure do hate my life here with my alcoholic father. I sure wish some mythological creature would come take me away forever. That sure would be amazing. Why would she do that? You guys seem like really close friends. Says to you the night that you watch the demon video that she wants to run away is clearly the most affected by the demon video. Then none of you know notice as she proceeds to progressively lose her mind over the course of the next week leading up to her disappearance that you got mad about. We're all prisoners because of you. Then after her disappearance, you realize that she was deep dive researching the child stealing demon. And once you talk to the mental asylum patient, you tap your chin in thought with the realization of, oh, I guess she did want to leave, huh? It's really about these relationships between these girls. It's about a group of four best friends. These four friends are so tight. We've been friends for a really long time. It comes across in the film that like we're buddies sometimes i wish i could just leave so anyway the group all agrees to go get black bagged out in the woods the plan as it is unraveled involves the group collecting their most valued possessions in the hope of sacrificing them supposedly doing this contact slender man because i guess that's different than summoning him fair enough though apparently this is the subscription service for being able to hang out with slender man rather than just leaving a message on his answering machine chloe brought with her the last photo that was taken with her and her dad, Hallie brought a blanket that her late grandmother made for her when her sister was born, and Warren brought a clay pot that she made when she was five. And she's really proud of it. Two of them actually have sentimental objects. <laughs> I don't fucking believe that the pot she made when she was five years old is on par with a picture of her deceased dad <laughs> yeah. and the grandma's little blanket. Right. He was really proud of that pot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a fucking narcissist. <laughs> Is that or she's like, maybe I can fake it. <laughs> yeah, I don't love anything. I'm too edgy. So as they proceed to send their friend requests to Slender Man, Warren here reminds us that Hallie does track because this is absolutely a group of real friends with real character traits. Surprised you didn't bring one of your trophies or medals. Then she hands out the blindfolds and informs them that the reason for this is that looking into Slender Man's face makes you go insane. So... Uh, yeah, obviously, because of that, they cannot take them off the whole time. Ever. Under any circumstances. Because, yeah, you know, one would imagine that going insane and probably killing yourself because of it wouldn't be the most fun of activities. Seems to be a fairly strong motivator. I'm sure all of them will do it. They tie their blindfolds, all hold hands, and sit in silence for a bit until the sounds of the forest go silent. Twigs begin snapping and church bell ring 1.mp3 starts playing. And then Warren reminds everyone to keep their blindfolds on and so naturally Chloe immediately removes it. Keep your blindfolds on. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Why? <laughs> 
Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, I, I oh my almost god. missed the other jump scare. <laughs> I, I didn't actually see what she reacted to. I, I, I don't see, even uh, know uh, what, uh, what uh, happened. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There was just a loud noise. No, 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 no. I didn't actually see it. Like, was there something spooky. there? Yeah, 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 that was a jump scare. <laughs> oh, right. I, it, well, well, I mean, it was so good that I didn't even realize. Yeah, yeah, so here, here, I'll show you again, here. Okay, oh, let me, it like, took my really breath away. intently look at this jump scare. Yep, yep, yep. I can't even you see You really have to anything. squint to see it, ironically. You really have to look. Oh, did you see it? Did you see uh, it? No. No, I, I saw it. I actually didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's I, there, it's I, there. I, I it's there. didn't see it. I'm really I, trying to look. Okay, I didn't one more see time. It. One more time. I promise it's play there. It, I play okay. it at, like, I'm going to look directly I'm going in the middle to, of the screen. I'm going to bring it down to, let's see, whatever the first level of slower is. Let me just it here. Three... Three quarters speed. Okay, yeah, yeah. So. Oh, or six, seven, whatever. So yeah, here we go. Six, seven. <gasps> six, six, six speed, please. Yeah. I see eyeballs. Oh, oh, I saw the hand. I saw the oh, hand. Oh, the hand. <laughs> Dude, I Fingers. still didn't see it. Uh... I still didn't see it. Nope. Fuck it. <laughs> Fuck it. Don't don't you dare play play that again. No, 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 I didn't no. even don't, want to see it. Worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll put the red circle over it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank yeah. You. Thank you. You gotta make up a thumbnail. Yeah. yeah. Did you catch it that time? Nope. Well. <laughs> now you have to get see the jump scare. It's important. God damn it. This is the <laughs> hardest movie to try to be scared for. Oh, I saw the little <laughs> shoulder movement. Oh. Ah! <laughs> there we go. Got it. Yep, nailed Man, it. This is... Whoa, this is a shadow. <laughs> oh, I'm scared. I'm too scared. I gotta leave the theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. This was advertised as like the scariest movie ever made or some nonsense <laughs> like that. Nothing's even happening. No fucking way. <laughs> Through a barrage of barely distinguishable shades of black, I was kind of able to make out Chloe screaming and running off, while Hallie and Warren somehow managed to get separated in their pursuit of her. <laughs> I literally can't even see what just happened. I, I know, yeah. It it's... is so dark. Okay, thank God. <laughs> thank you, movie. That was a fun jump scare just there. My heart rate moved a little bit, and I shifted <laughs> in my chair slightly. <laughs> oh, cool. The, the the one like white light blur that I can see amongst the fucking taken three sh camera shake and cuts. Cool. I love it. I don't even know what the fuck I'm looking at. Cool first glimpse of Slender Man. Awesome. Yep. When they finally find her, clearly already on the brink of madness, Warren immediately realizes that Chloe's a moron. I guess there's technically an argument to be had that maybe Chloe's the smartest out of all of them. Since they were performing the ritual given to them by the internet stranger their missing friend was talking to, she may have come to the epiphany of, maybe I should check to make sure we aren't about to have our kidneys stolen. Because honestly, the possibility of supernatural involvement is still fairly low at this point. However, considering the fact that that she was willing to go through with it up to this point sadly implies to me that this isn't the case. She was just the big spook, so she immediately did the thing that Warren had literally just told her not to do. Put this on. Don't take it off. If you do, a demon will take your soul. Yeah, but like, what if it don't do, though? Don't you hear the spooky noises? Yes, Chloe, it's probably Slender Man. The reason that we're here. However, before Warren can properly articulate the pure insanity of Chloe's actions, Hallie cuts her off with a, whoa there, Ren. You're getting mighty meticulous with your thoughts there. If you're not careful, we might prevent the movie from happening. We didn't get Katie back. That's what happened. What the hell are you talking about, Hallie? You don't even know if you would have gotten Callie... Katie. God. You don't even know if you would have gotten Katie back because Chloe interrupted the ritual. Don't get me wrong, there's no way in hell it was going to work because obviously, but you have zero ground to be getting mad at Warren. You're the one who agreed to come out into the wilderness in the middle of the night, and I'm entirely convinced that the only reason you didn't get kidnapped is because Warren is bad at directions and went to an entirely different part of the forest. It wasn't a ritual. It was just fucking, like, 
It was Slender Man saying, Come feed me. <laughs> and they're like, And you'll give us our friend back? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll give your fucking friend back. Just come out here and give me your favorite shit and blindfold yourself. <laughs> okay. You give it, uh huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Uh, Honestly. <laughs> oh, but he said he was going to give her back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's wearing a suit, Zach. <laughs> you're not allowed to do that. It's unconstitutional. <laughs> anyway, Chloe's crazy now. <laughs> <laughs> what? She was choking herself. <laughs> she was choking herself. The Slender Man's a vampire. He's invisible in yours. Did it, why didn't you just cut after the choking in the hands rather than uh, you just had to show him, didn't you? This is really great. <laughs> after Slender Man advertises to her that he's coming to play Tickle Me Elmo with her brain, the little moron decides to open the door for him and patiently wait for the madness to take hold. What, why are we Oh, the violin, doing the violin, oh, the violin, uh, the violin. Oh, no. uh, there won't be any, anything there. Oh, nothing. It's nothing. But wait, there will be How something in like five, know? four, three, yeah, no, it's, two. It's almost like this one. Oh my god! I got... Predictable. <laughs> <laughs> that was almost down to the second. It was actually. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like I have a knack for shit. It's almost like things like this have happened in movies before. It's almost like mm. it's a trope. <laughs> Her subsequent absence from the school is barely addressed as nobody seems to have noticed. Tom here is the only one who actually brings it up, to which it is explained away with... She's fine. Just a cold. Where's your, uh, where's your friend, Token oh, Black Girl? Uh, I mean, Chloe. Uh, 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 cold. <laughs> cold. Cold. She's sick. Yeah, that she's, one, um, sure. Um, she's sad that her dad is, dad is dead. Her dad's been dead you know, for right. years, though. You yeah, but, you know, she's... It. Yeah, she's still really choked up about yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Today's the anniversary. <laughs> no, but, like, the anniversary's today, but she's been gone for multiple days. Yeah, but, you, you know, today, though, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, it's yeah. just like... You know, like, well, it's the weather, you know, it was really sunny when he died. It was really sunny today. It's like the sunshine reminds her of that horrible day, you know. So it's probably best for her to stay indoors and, like, you know, shut the blinds and everything. Why won't you answer my calls, second friend to go missing? <laughs> Needless to say, as our movie goes on, Hallie and Chloe proceed as normal until one day they realize, ah, oh, we were a group of four, weren't we? Upon realizing this, Warren frantically asks if Hallie has spoken with Chloe, to which she responds that she's tried, but her mom keeps shooting her down. Despite the fact that Warren also has the ability to reach out to her friends, she gets really frustrated about this and says that they have to go check on her immediately. And so they do just that. Right after another reminder that Hallie does track. And there's nothing we can do, and I have track. I can't just track. I have track? <laughs> Since when have you had track? <laughs> I have track. I have a personality trait, guys. I do track. <laughs> <laughs> Movie. I... <laughs> I have track. I have track. 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 It's super it's important. I know for a fact Slender Man exists and he's doing all of these really weird things, but I have track. I mean, yeah, two of our best friends are missing. It's a very non-specific track. I so have to go sense. do homework. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, the only practical time that they can check up on their friends' well-being is in the middle of the goddamn night, because that's the only time these people do anything. Which, speaking of, why the absolute hell are these parents letting their kids walk around randomly in the middle of the night when there are kids disappearing? Seems like a bit of an oversight, but, uh, well. Footnote as I am editing. Check out how the light changes in every single shot.
They approach the house in the most suspicious way imaginable and proceed to peer through the living room window rather than just knocking on the door because it's their friend's house. After a brief moment of nothing happening from this, Chloe eventually jump scares them, standing directly behind the window, staring past them into space. The girls try to get her attention, but to no avail as she just kind of glares forward. So Chloe's mom's just kind of letting her daughter plunge herself into madness, huh? No going to the doctor or anything? We're just going to keep her home and let her aimlessly wander around the house while she swipes at the invisible elves circling her head? Are you even home right now? Know where your daughter is or what she's doing? No? That okay. I mean, it looks like she can still pretty well dress herself and maintain her hair, so I guess there's still a little bit of sanity left. She was just a bit heavy on the eyeliner. No need for supervision yet, I suppose. Anyway, after that thorough review of their friend's mental well-being, Warren and Hallie take off, heading back to their own respective houses. <laughs> what the f- <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hi, Chloe. Hey, bye. <laughs> Baffling. <laughs> Actually baffling. They're certainly taking the death sentence that's been handed to their longtime super close BFF pretty well. Keep in mind, at this point, Hallie and Wren have both had their own individual experiences with Slenderman. So they're fully aware of what's going on and why Chloe's mental state is deteriorating. And since this line exists... It's different for everyone, but it only ends in insanity or death then I can pretty safely say that you're fully aware that Chloe is marching straight to her untimely demise. You'd think that at least pretending to care about it might be on the table. These four friends are so tight. I suppose Warren's a bit on the distraught side, but that kind of just seems like an in general kind of thing. Hallie here just seems a bit more concerned with ushering all of this along so she can make her date in time. Fear. Slender man be damned, I have to go get some <laughs> dick. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe never shows up again, by the way, nor is she ever mentioned again. She sure contributed a lot, didn't she? The character arc of wasn't crazy and then was crazy. Congratulations on that, I suppose. I guess that's technically progression. One step forward is, in fact, still forward. However, Chloe's here on out complete and utter dismissal and forgotten nature doesn't just shine a light even further on Hallie and Warren's psychopathy. It's kind of shining a light on the blue pen that Sony absolutely absolutely took to this stupid ass script. There was obviously more that happened with this character. I, I, I don't need to see the trailer to know that. And so the question from here moves to, why the hell did you cut it out? They wanted a PG-13 rating. Right, because cutting around blood splatter is completely impossible. I feel this isn't the reason. What else we got? Smooth brain Sony boardroom solution to a potential controversy from comparisons to the 2014 stabbings possible, yes. But just think, if these scenes hadn't have gotten cut, we wouldn't have gotten to see the CGI Satan ritual that they threw in at the end of the movie, with the choking baby sound effects. Not sure where the hell you got that from, you freaks. But I guess you thought the imagery of nude and dismembered minors was less repulsive than someone stabbing themselves in the eye. Sorry for almost scratching you with that sewing needle. Let me amend it by beating you in the face with this cricket bat. Studio boardroom intervention saves the day once again, everyone. But we do have other things to talk about, so let's get ourselves back on track. Uh, we still have so much of this movie left. Who are these characters? <laughs> Why are they? Uh, one I is named no idea. Ren. Wait, which one's which? <laughs> one is one is well one one is named Ren and one is named H Haley or one Holly. Them, I don't see how you can get them mixed up. One of them does track, the other doesn't. Like, come on. Mm. <laughs> how could I have missed that? <laughs> As I said, Hallie has a date through all of this. Thankfully, the movie has been shoving down our throats the whole time that these two like each other so that we can get this scene of him asking her out, followed by Hallie staring at Slenderman off in the distance in all his CGI glory. Oh my <laughs> god! Oh my god, he's wearing a suit! Oh that CGI god. is so good! I'd like to point out, like, for how much I've, like, tried provided, the tentacles that I made for this video were way better than that crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was oh, awful. was there tentacles? I yeah. Yeah, yeah, there were tentacles. All, uh, oh, Slender man. Slender like, man and a necktie. All its CGI glory. Look at this crap. Look at this thing. Oh, my oh, God. It's it looks so, so good. bad. Oh, oh, God. They, They're like facing through the bushes. That's brilliant. <laughs> Hallie. 
Did are you did you see Slender Man? Are you gonna go crazy now that you have seen Slender Man's face and we have established that you go crazy when you see Slender Man's face? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, no, she was she was too no, far you see, away. Yeah, Tom. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, too, okay. I, I didn't say that. Will said that. <laughs> oh, Tom, fuck. you fucking asshole. Oh, oh. What the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah, bro? Tom. Making up with bullshit. <laughs> what, did, what did I do? I'm just a bystander here. <laughs> Look, okay. So, Tom, you I'm fucking a, dick. Ver, as long I'm as very it's... tired, and you're usually to blame for everything, so I apologize. Yeah, so, right. Okay, so I made that... I made this movie. Let's all kick Tom's ass with the bar of soap <laughs> and the tube sock now. <laughs> it makes sense though, because Slender Man was really far away, so the crazy the crazy signal yeah. couldn't reach her. So so there we go. Yeah, so well, a... I mean you no, no, could no, 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 see no, no, no. I mean you could see him, <laughs> no, no, no. but you can't actually I, see his I, face. I actually you know? have a logical explanation for it. She was down in a valley and the radio signals ah. couldn't reach there. Ah. <laughs> Staying consistent with the fact that nobody has parents, Hallie goes over to his house and the two pretend to have character moments for a bit until they start making out on the couch. Touch my records. <laughs> <laughs> I just made a better romance than this is for movie. <laughs> I'm gonna put something else on. No, this is good. Royalty free, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this isn't going to last too long as our little romantic scene of young love is about to be thrust into, well, something else entirely. I hesitate to call it horror because typically when one thinks of that genre, they imagine something, I don't know, horrifying. Ironically enough, the movie decided to do this in one of the most well-lit night scenes I've witnessed thus far, which truly highlighted the amount of transitional effects and filters that were thrown over whatever the hell the editors were trying to do here. So, okay, I, would, I need to prepare you guys real quick because we're, Disgusting. We, are, All right. we are actually about to come to the, uh, oh. the best, oh my God. The Don't best say part that. of the movie. No, the no. best part of the movie. The best part of the movie. It has nothing to know. do with that what is, is currently statement. on screen. Right there. I don't know if you can top the creaking trees. Oh man, oh man. Like you don't even know. You don't even know. All right, I'm ready now. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come here. Right. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god, that is like the worst what effect the fuck I've is ever that seen face? in my life. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> what in the. <laughs> oh, you like I'm gonna make that up there. <laughs> 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 what the fuck? Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> what the hell? I'm sorry, I'm not me when I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> And this is why you always give bitches dinner first. <laughs> I think that what's truly the most beautiful thing about this is that the camera keeps cutting back and forth between Hallie and Tom, and every time it does so, Tom has a new expression on his face. <laughs> and Hallie proceeds to sit there screaming in horror for a solid eight seconds before Tom finally decides, huh. She must be giving me a sign of some sort. Afterwards, we cut to the kitchen where we can proceed to have the no, don't bring the evil into your life too cliche. This goes on for a reasonable amount of time in which Hallie makes Tom promise that he won't watch the video. It goes exactly the way you are picturing it. Oh God, no, don't worry, it's fine. Please don't do the thing. Okay, I won't do the thing. If you have ever seen any movie in your entire life, ever, then you know exactly what this moron is about to do. In fact, even the movie knows that you know, because it doesn't even wait to let you know what happened. The very next scene, we cut to the classroom where Tom enters and is now wearing a beanie and a coat. Apparently, watching the video made him decide to look like a homeless person who just inhaled glue as he twitches his way to his desk and sits down at it. Needless to say, the teacher takes absolutely no notice of this, because in Slender Man world, the adults are about as 
as observant as a young Helen Keller on a good day. Hallie calls out to Tom, asking if he's okay, and Tom gives her the I'm not crazy expression before turning away and we see a burn or something on his arm. I love how they focus on the, the hand rather than the, you know, giant ass bruise on his arm. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hallie then proceeds to look all sad and turns away, because apparently she didn't see that coming a billion miles away. Man, way to like your, make yourself look even crazier, Ren. <laughs> <laughs> Just carving that in the middle of class, okay. <laughs> And, and just, I guess that walk, no one noticed that. No, no one noticed just her walk carving by her. She's just like eating a rat raw. <laughs> it's like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> She's just carving it into the fucking table. I think that was the black girl. Hold on. Hold oh on. my. No, because this was no. uh, this was a deleted scene. This was a deleted scene. She was actually supposed to die in this scene. Oh so. my oh, god. So she's not done yet. So she's not crazy. Yeah, that's her arm. Uh, of they really liked this shot, so they cut out her death scene, but that they, but then they kept this shot of her scribbling that into her desk, and then made it look like it was Ren doing it. Wow, that's wow. impressive. Wow, <laughs> wow, wow, wow! Wow, whitewashing! Wow. Come on, White <laughs> whitewashing! <laughs> they just turned the fucking resolution that, up and the fucking is, saturation down they're like there you go that's, that's red that's something so they they cut out her death scene <sighs> oh yeah man they wow. cut so much out in, of this in, movie in a horror movie <laughs> they mo cut movie. so one of the much. main, like, hey, you one know of the main too characters much death in this horror movie one of the main group of characters back a little bit because it's going to be the scariest movie ever. We we sh we sh we should cut out these death scenes. <laughs> One of the Both main. Too scary. Okay. Finally, let's take a couple minutes to take a look at Warren and what she's been up to during all this. She's decided that she's going to partake in the obligatory research monster exposition scene, which is coming complete in a library setting. We see her looking through a bunch of Slenderman sightings on the internet, which includes some of the actual pictures that were posted on the forum board that started the legend. I didn't even think about the fact that they were just randomly pulling slender man pictures from our reality and using them as sightings pictures yeah, wow yeah. that's yeah, like... the fuck took that picture in this fucking world in this world not our world they yeah. know it's fucking yeah, yeah. photoshopped in our world obviously yeah yeah but uh, who took that shit in the movie uh yeah uh-huh <laughs> yeah. yeah whoops you whoops yeah. she searches pattern of missing children and this apparently comes up with more slender man stuff shame the police didn't think of that regardless she ends up finding an author that evidently has a book written on the subject yeah just highlight it for the sake of the audience yeah <laughs> In, in, in case we can't you guys want to know what if she was on a, a, a linux that's probably why she got all the answers like right away Probably, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. Like, with, I mean, like, if you don't have a Linux, then you're just a fucking plebeian. What's the bet she's gonna find the book she's looking for instantly, like first? Oh, uh, six, six, six. Slender Man is real. Ah, hey. oh, there it is. <laughs> oh my goodness. Of course, this is just going to lead into scary bit because we haven't had scary bit happen for a scene or two. The library is plunged into darkness, which means, oh boy, I'm back to painfully squinting at my screen again. Not like it's terribly much of a difference because prior to such, this place also appears to have been lit with technology from the early 1900s. You know how libraries are supposed to be well lit because people read in them? Seems like the purpose is rather defeated when you have to be huddled next to the desk lamp in order to not be consumed by shadow, but... Uh. I don't know the library, I suppose. Oh my god, scary irrelevant stuff I'm gonna skip over. <laughs> Look, I, I'm just, I just want to say I'm really happy that you're reading at your local library. I'm very Keep proud up. of you for that. Keep up the good work. You know the easy way to find your way out of this is knock the fucking shelves over. <laughs> Like, rather than normal hallucinations, we're just going to make them see in kaleidoscope vision because that's easier. <laughs> and then we're going to turn on the fisheye lens and then we're yeah. just going to slowly yeah. crank it up. Yeah, save some money on the CGI budget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Premiere Pro, for all the default <laughs> effects. Throw something at him, even. Just, like, do something. God. Nah, uh, there's there's nothing around here they can throw. Nah. Nothing on these shelves in particular. Nah, nah. Seriously, I'd at least throw a punch at this fucking thing. I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna die. <laughs> yeah. I might as well try. I can go to hell saying I punched that bitch in the face. Oh, no, you saw his face. You're going crazy now. Yeah, she's in crazy range. 
Oh, uh, is this head going to come down? Thank you for supporting your local library. There's not, not, not enough people oh, to do it's, that. I just it's, a, it's Alien, show me it's your alien 3. Card. Thank you very much for supporting your local library. Now I want you to spread the message. Uh, oh god, he put play oh, no. on my oh, face. Oh no! no. <laughs> she doesn't have now, a face now! Now she's the slender man. <laughs> <laughs> Why did Slenderman do that? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Just to troll uh, her? <laughs> this is incredibly scary. So as we cut to school the next day, Warren approaches Hallie and proceeds to act insane at her. She explains the contents of the book that she got from the library and how it coincides with their little dilemma. Let's take a look at the fruits of her labor, shall we? Paranormal contact with bioelectric systems often result in a symbiotic relationship. The effects on host organisms have been well documented and manifest in various forms such as personality change, bizarre behavior, mental illness, psychosis, loss of touch on reality, self-mutilation, and non-specific dissolution. They just disappear. I have many questions. Paranormal contact with bioelectric systems often result in a symbiotic relationship. Okay, I'm guessing you're talking about possession here. Hiding the sentence, ghosts can possess people, behind a collection of fancy wording. Everything you say from that point on is just describing possession. Personality change, self-mutilation, psychosis. It's kind of hard to say though, because for whatever reason, you decided to throw the word symbiotic in there. Contrary to what you may be thinking, possession is not symbiotic. Rather implies that the host is getting something out of the whole ordeal. I'm not sure why you didn't go with parasitic, Mr. P.H paranormal expert, but I suppose you just didn't think that that word conveyed the level of your sophistication properly. Also, so I googled nonspecific dissolution, jumped through a lot of hoops to figure out what the hell you meant by that. The phrase seems to be primarily used for the context of chemistry. A lot of the results I got were papers that were simply using it in passing in certain pharmaceutical or other observational reports. So instead, I looked up the definition of dissolution, and I got the closing down or dismissal of an assembly, partnership, or official body. <gasps> so basically, it means for something to end. So therefore, a non-specific disillusion would be for something to end in a way that is lacking detail. Little bit of a stretch for that to mean disappearance, movie. You guys sure did go through a lot of trouble to try and make yourselves sound smart in this scene. How many thesauruses did you go through to come up with that? I know a greater majority of people watching Ren babbling on about this said to themselves, I have no idea what she's talking about, but it explains everything. But I for one decided I wanted to know what exactly you were going on about. I suspect I'm probably the only person who has gone through this much trouble for this movie. What do you suppose those Just, uh, what do you suppose those words on screen mean? A non-specific dissolution. Yeah, I was just rereading that. Dissolution. Just a I have no um, fucking idea. Um it means I it mean, means that a dissolution that's non-specific. <laughs> so so that the writers can do whatever they want. They just disappear. So uh, non-specific dissolute what wait non-specific dis no no wait wait that it but that is specific though they do disappear because slender man sh makes sh chooses them to make them disappear so it's specific oh, that's irrelevant it's the actual disappearance itself that's so dumb <laughs> yes <laughs> Why didn't the author just say eventual disappearance? Do you really think that the demographic of people that are coming to read about Slender Man possession are going to catch the nuances of your pretentious writing style? Oh, I suppose they would, wouldn't they?
Let's not dwell on that. How the hell did Warren know what non-specific disillusion meant? It took me like five minutes to derive disappearance from it, and that's with me looking for that answer. How long do you think it took our little not reporter here to figure it out as she's sitting here stuttering and pausing mid-sentence as if she's forgetting what she's saying even though she's reading it from a book? Anyway, there's a bit of banter between the two, and then Warren asks Hallie if there's been anything weird that's happened to her recently. Hallie is hesitant at first before admitting that she saw Slender Man in the trees when Tom asked her out. Damn. I don't think words could properly describe how irritated I would be if I were Ren right now. I just went through literal hell while I was at the library, trying to figure out how to save us. I was being tormented by the thing for what felt like hours, and I briefly lost touch on what was actually real. You're slightly spooked because you thought you saw him at the end of the tree line while your crush was asking you out. I am so sorry for your traumatic experience, Hallie. So, I'd like to point out, as some of you may have already noticed, the actual narrative is getting pretty jumbled at this point. The obvious cutting and re-editing that took place in this movie becomes oh so much more prevalent in the second and third acts. Basically, what we can come to on this is that the movie stops having a story at this point and just kind of becomes a series of scenes showing random things happening. There are setups given to us that are almost immediately forgotten, and as we move forward, you'll find that this is just going to devolve into a barely coherent mess of CGI paint splattered against a wall. So what this is basically coming down to is I'm not going to go over it. It's all useless. Instead, I will provide you with my buddies and I laughing at it, because honestly, there's nothing of substance to go over other than Hallie's an idiot and thought that the sound of Katie's ethereal voice calling out to her from the woods meant, my missing friend's in there. I better sprint headfirst in without a flashlight. I'll, I'll follow this disembodied voice of my missing friend out into the woods because <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. Because... Well, because it's Kate. Well, it's my friend. Well, yeah, it's clearly... Yeah. Just calling my name. Why wouldn't I answer? Why? You wouldn't answer yeah. your friend when they say your name, yeah. Tom? What's wrong with you? Well, when she says, help me, in a distorted, like, echoey voice, it's like, yeah, that's... Katie! 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 Katie? Did you come here in the woods? <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ! Oh my god! Katie? Oh my god! You fucking scared me, dude! Holy that shit! Was, that was the scariest thing in this whole movie. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Makes complete sense that Katie would be calling me in the fucking woods when everything bad's happened in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were walking just fine through like everything, and now you're just hitting everything. Are the trees closing in on her? What the fuck is this? <laughs> Oh, oh my no, god. No, they got Cody. No, 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 no. It's, it's no. Katie. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't. He didn't see her. She's completely sick. Oh, no. He's going like to be around the corner. The there he is. There's the boy. Oh, my God. Ah, it was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> what was that fucking edit? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure what's happening. What? <laughs> oh my god, the tentacles! Oh my god, it's, it's, she's pregnant with tentacle things. Uh, that was, uh, oh, it was a dream, dream within a dream. <laughs> it's Inception! <laughs> My God, yep, so she was pregnant with the tentacle man thing, um... but it's over now, and it will be done with because God. you know, just like many things in this oh movie, it, it won't come back again. After whatever the hell that was, Hallie hears a bit of a scuffle happening downstairs. She finds Lizzie, who is currently having trouble breathing. Did you remember her? The movie brought this person back, but not Chloe. Let that sink in for a bit. Also, way to finally show up again, Hallie's parents. I kind of just assumed you'd stopped existing along with the police. But now that you're here, you can provide some important insight on the situation. Are you ready? I'm doing Lizzie, my best. Wake Come up. on, Lizzie. Look Come on, Lizzie. Anything. Come on, Lizzie. Just this thing you're doing right now to her is making everything. <laughs> Worse. <laughs> I'm doing my best, Lizzie. By shaking like, you. Shaking you harder. <laughs> Get up, bitch. Lamb. Lamb. I'm doing Lizzie, my best. What? Yep. You sound unquestionably panicked about the situation, Dad. We cut to the latest building that didn't have a lighting budget, wherein we can move into more weird crap. Hooray, everyone. We did it. 
We made it to the CGI budget expenses. Let's immerse ourselves in the abstract horror of trying to hit the hour and a half mark because we cut so goddamn much out that the movie's only 45 minutes long. Nobody can critique this if we make it so nothing happens, right? Au contraire, Sony Pictures Entertainment. Little do you know of my secret weapon of skipping literally all of it. They still haven't checked up on their other friend. <laughs> nah, she's fine. <laughs> 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 Meta hey Tom you, I'm not around, around. No. Leave me a f fuck off Leave me alone <laughs> You love that text up above That said like Hey Don't look at that video Like I won't <laughs> <laughs> It's like Like, uh, like sarcastic I just Like oh, you a I won't look at the link video to this, Wink don't wink Don't look at it Oh my gosh They closed their folders At the same time <laughs> What are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> what? Slender uh, Man, what everyone! <laughs> well, oh, that dude has no eyes, I guess. What? Oh, what a happy family. Oh, oh my! <laughs> Evil grandma! Oh, the no. a lot what the fuck like was that four, face? Four, 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 that was... Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Here you go. Hi, Slender Man. Ah! Get Whoa. subverted. Whoa. <laughs> Where are you even going? You're telling me she just did like a loop around the entire hospital <laughs> just to get back to the same room. Lizzie, like you forgot to put your makeup on. Oh you're God, too, you're very pale. Oh, 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 oh no! Oh, they fell. Oh, oh no! She's Wait, having a they stroke. CGI'd oh, her <laughs> mouth. <laughs> they CGI'd her Twitch. mouth twitching. Yes, oh, maybe. <laughs> You she got can't... this assy actor to act straight. Ah, whoa! <laughs> what uh, the fuck? You know the forest. What? If I had the money of Elvis, the symbolism of Elvis, I would shoot my fucking TV too. What the fuck? What the fuck is this? <laughs> the fuck is going on? Her face looks like a foot. Oh, the gate! Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm all, good. It was all very important plot information that we got there, Tom. God. Sorry, what information it, did it, we get? This is by far the scariest movie in history. I told you, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. I like Antichrist 2 movie, but you're not <laughs> Lars von Trier. I, I can't believe I'm saying that, but Lars von Trier is a better filmmaker than you are. <laughs> DMT trip number two down. Awesome. Let's see how much more blood we can squeeze out of the stone. Lizzie's crazy again, and she starts screaming about someone who doesn't have a face. Hallie acts like this is a surprise. Have you tried shaking Whoa. her really hard and saying, I'm doing my best? <laughs> like, <laughs> You're telling me Slender Man was part of this? <laughs> Now armed with her latest bits of easily inferred information, Hallie goes to Lizzie's laptop where she finds out that she's also been on the super creepy Slender Man website. She clicks play on a button that was just there. I, I have no idea. There was no file that she opened. It doesn't look to be part of the website. There's just a random play button hovering in the corner of the screen. This brings up a video showing Warren bringing Lizzie out into the woods to try the whole sacrifice something you love plan again. She even turns the camera towards herself so we can get the dramatic reveal that she was the one to drag Lizzie out here. As if anybody else would be doing it. Why did she ask Warren what she was doing like she had no idea? Did she just show up to the house and tell Lizzie to grab some toys she liked and then follow her out into the woods? Did Lizzie really not question that up until this point? Also, what about the blindfolds? I was gonna forget about the blindfolds, Warren. Speaking of the blindfolds, remember Chloe? Yeah, yeah, you know, your friend that was losing her mind a little bit ago? Yeah, I kind of forgot about her, didn't we? I wonder how she's doing. You think maybe the whole ordeal was a sign that the sacrificing procedure isn't going to get you anywhere. Why did you bring Lizzie out here to try again? What logic dictated that this would be different at all from last time? So Hallie goes to Warren's house and begins banging on the door, screaming for her. Surprise, surprise, she also doesn't have parents. Once found, the understandable confrontation takes place of, why would you bring my sister into this crap, you asshole? And in response, Warren says this. To get Lizzie back. To make him stop! I'm sorry, what was that? To get Lizzie back. One, one more time, I'm sorry, what? To get Lizzie back. Wow, you forgot her name. That's great. <laughs>
<laughs> that makes me so happy. Okay, this is like okay. I need to tell. I need to show you this. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that subtitle. Uh... <laughs> I'd like to point out, Lizzie is not the one who is missing. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> oh, oh my god. The yeah, characters so forgot Christ. what each other's names were. <laughs> oh hey, man, my god. That's not as bad as people forgetting their lines. It, it, Holy like, reading fuck. other people's lines. Jesus. <laughs> to get Lizzie back. You're trying to get Katie back, you retard. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Isn't this movie oh great? It's just, like, <laughs> it's just like we have to we have to get Lizzie oh, back. It's, it's what, you mean wait, you mean your sister? <laughs> like no, our best friend, the redhead. It's like what? <laughs> what? Who the fuck is what? Lizzie? I'm not sure if Joey King said Lizzie intentionally or if the script actually said Katie and the editors used the wrong take. But either way, it's beyond hilarious. We get stupid implications regardless of what's happening here. Because if it's the former, then that means that the writers forgot what their characters were called. Or if it's the latter, that means everybody involved with shooting either missed her saying that or responded with the general attitude of, Meh. We're almost done. And then during the entirety of the editing process, not one person called the actress and said, Ah, uh, yeah, Joey, we need to ADR our line from you real quick. Let that sink in for a moment. Really bask in it. If there is nothing else you take from this video, just understand that the people in this movie were mixing each other up by the end. There's a certain beauty in that that I don't think can be conveyed in words. And so Warren explains how giving Slenderman something you love isn't enough, and how he actually wants them. If we gave him everything that he asked for, and we were holding any more cars, I don't know why he would do not take more. I don't know why. This is following followed by scary cicada noises coming from downstairs. We get the same thing we got with Chloe, where Warren's phone shows us a video feed slowly making its way up to the attic. Warren says, that's, that's here. And I couldn't help but close my eyes in meditative embarrassment from how much they barely even try to disguise that this character is just explaining to the audience what's going on. I better stand here and do nothing. <laughs> This is followed up by the trees pulling an evil dead as a bunch of branches burst through the window and yank her out into the darkness. I guess Slenderman can just do that, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Damn. That death was unceremonious as hell. I guess that means we're at the climax of the movie now. Kind of hard to tell, though, because this movie has already shown it has zero regard for its characters on top of the fact that this spooky scene is exactly the same as the last spooky scene. Nothing's really changed. Slenderman isn't doing anything different from what he normally does. He's pretty much just decided this isn't fun anymore, and so he's moving things along a bit. I know the whole point of the movie is for us to watch this and think, Oh, mysterious! But in all honesty, I find it kind of hard to watch this and not immediately feel that Slenderman just got tired of forming castles out of his mashed potatoes and finally decided to just eat it. At this point, we get some flashbacks to some dialogue that we literally just heard, which makes Hallie come to the conclusion of, Huh. Yeah, maybe I can't beat the reality bender. Which prompts her to decide to go sprinting into the forest again with the intent of sacrificing herself. Why would she do this, you may ask? Other than the fact that she knows that we're almost to the minimum time limit at the very least. Unfortunately, I can only guess, because as is the case with pretty much everything beyond Katie's disappearance, the events of the film are so incredibly disjointed and seemingly unrelated to one another that it's almost impossible to decrypt the motivations behind any of these idiots' actions. Thanks to good old studio boardroom intervention, the canon of Slender Man is that Warren did crazy stuff because she was crazy, and then Hallie gave up and went frolicking through the forest to play hopscotch with the neighborhood pedophile. And this in turn made Lizzie decide to monologue profound Slender Man stuff after her insane screaming fit in the hospital. Oh, uh, zoom in. Uh, uh, yep, okay. Oh, where's the boy? Yep, nothing there. Let's oh, do the nope, eye zoom. Nothing there. Let's, oh. let's pan over. He's oh, going to yeah, pop up no, there. Oh, 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 no, oh, 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 pan back. Oh, oh. Yep, pan back. Oh my god. Oh my god, there he is. What a surprise. Oh my god, you you could I'm almost very see his much face spooked. if it wasn't so <laughs> fucking black. 
everybody screams because I look like a tree, and it's really mean and offensive. <laughs> <and everybody screams. laughs> Can you please apologize? Hurting my feelings. And that's pretty much exactly what happens here. After Hallie steps through the gates of hell, she's greeted by their recruiting agent, to which she immediately says, Take me. Slender Man agrees to these terms, but as he begins the taking procedure, Hallie says, Hmm, but now you're big and scary, so perhaps not. And then she runs away. <laughs> Hello, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> she runs around for a little bit more to give us the illusion of a horror climax and then she gets absorbed into a tree it's all very terrifying and disturbing as you can imagine as the cgi is barely blended in with the actual bark of the tree that it's being shot in front of and uh there we go uh yeah that's the uh, that's the end of the movie I'm not joking. They ended with spooky, disturbing tree visuals, along with an attempted wrap-up through Lizzie saying a bunch of stuff that didn't actually relate to what the movie was about. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> so movie. Just, movie? You just haven't been this about message? this. You really? haven't been about this at all, okay? <laughs> Congratulations, Slender Man. You hit the time limit. I suppose the impending crash into a brick wall can happen now. It's all spreading his word, you know? Yep, wonderful closing line. I know you may be thinking it's a bit out of place and weird, but I don't think there's a better way you could have summed up the amount of indecisiveness, hesitation, and ultimately unrelated blender animations that made up the narrative of this film. It's a bold choice for a filmmaker to end his movie by just halting the production. Although I suppose I should be fair even if it is Slender Man. This absolutely is not the ending that was in this script. And with that little kickoff point, let's begin the fun part of recapping and wrapping this idiocy up. Wow. <laughs> My that's, God, uh, that's a... Truth or Dare was more coherent. Yes. I think Truth or Dare is worse, <laughs> yeah. but the script is far better structure structured that was a complete disaster <laughs> uh, like you know how our scale it's it's weird like we, we basically say like the only thing that's like really a one is like when you screw with space and time but like i don't know i feel like i just watched a movie that was a one because it's just it's not coherent at all like well seriously like the best way to like come up with it like what what can you think of in that entire movie that was redeeming um hmm. something positive to say about it let me think about that actually for a second <sighs> I, I don't. I'm not, I got. I'm not even. Like, I, I'm not even like exaggerating. I know. Or like, I know. I, I'm like I'm, someone could be like, "You're not being charitable. You can't think of anything." I'm like, "No, I'm no, sorry. no. I, I, I can't." I am <laughs> actually like trying to think of something good about the film. I'm racking my brain for the most like. I can at least the... think of uh, of a quiet place to be incoherent. Yeah. Yeah. That... Like the 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 there's a clear through line for how like it's of easy cause and effect and structure, but the the it's oh. the. It's all the details that don't make any sense. It's, but at it's least... e easy to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The, this was like, like I said, you have first act stuff that's basically put together in the first five minutes. Then you have second act material that's like put like 20 minutes in, like 40 minutes of spookiness in the middle. And then like late second act and then all third act stuff thrown into the last 10 minutes. It's like, it's like they have excuses to have scares in the middle section of it and then they don't have anything to develop the characters or the plot in between edgy redhead goes missing because none of her friends noticed her going crazy over the course of a week and then they all go crazy and disappear because yeah there's literally nothing they can do about it. The sad thing is, is this actually could have been a decent movie, if not a good one. There are so many different avenues they could have taken with Slender Man because the legend itself, while relentlessly memed upon to all hell and back, holds a great deal of potential that is constantly wasted. If we're just going to start over from scratch, 
which doesn't even sound like a bad idea to begin with, why didn't she just go with something similar to what Slender the Arrival did? Person goes looking for their missing childhood friend, and because of that, Slender Man starts stalking her along with whoever else is under his influence. This isn't just the adaptation, that's not my Slender Man argument. This is objectively a better story, and it is monumentally more simple. On top of that, maybe it would have actually improved the meta things a little bit. The story not being centered around a bunch of teenage girls might have made some people a little less peeved at you, so maybe you wouldn't have had to cut half the movie out. Speaking of, my god, did you cut a lot out of this movie. Like, you cut a lot out of this movie. I can tell from the get-go that this was not the film that was put down onto paper when bright-eyed David Burke was sitting down at his computer saying, oh boy, I get to write a Slender Man movie. The amount of insane re-edits the movie must have had to go through, ranging from cut scenes, cut lines, cut characters, 80-yard lines to replace what was part of a potentially entirely different narrative. I, I can only imagine what kind of nightmare this must have been in the editing room. The trailer itself is borderline false advertising with the amount of crap in it that just straight up isn't in the movie. Ah, hey, look at that. Chloe stabbed herself in the face. I don't remember that being there. Hey, look at that. Tom was supposed to throw himself off a building and it was apparently a whole drawn out scene that they even finished the visual effects for. Hey, look at that. Allison was supposed to be in the movie. That's an entire character that was just axed from the film. My God, I'm surprised you people were even able to shove a movie out at all with the amount of crap that's missing. I can only imagine what the ending of this movie was originally meant to be because apparently the original version actually had an ending. Don't get me wrong, it still probably would have been awful, but dear Lord, at least it would have been something instead of dragging Lizzie back in at the very end of production and saying to her, hey. So we had to completely remove literally everything that this movie was originally about and now we don't have an ending or really even that much of a third act to begin with. Can you say... I don't, I don't know. Something conclusive and spooky into this microphone for me. We really need to end on something. And because of all that idiocy, we're left with this. Where characters are regularly forgotten and shrugged aside, and the movie randomly brings up crap as if it's going to be important later, but then it never is. I honestly don't think there's a worse fate that can befall a movie other than that. Non-existence is even better than a tortured one. These deleted scenes aren't even available on the Blu-ray release. All we have are these crappy behind-the- the scenes documentaries where everyone pretends to be excited for the thing. What a truly bizarre and tragic end for what was honestly kind of a spooky online legend. Damn. Rather somber and depressing end for the Halloween video. Getting through the Slender Man movie and realizing that it wasn't so much getting through as it was trying to make sense of what could have been. If only we could have seen what that could have been was. On that note, let's take a look at the original script. Oh yes, dear viewer. Turns out the original script was I, I don't I don't know, leaked or released or something. But before us, we have the original vision of the film and all the bull crap that was mercilessly sliced away from the final cut. And we will be closing out tonight, taking a look at some of that bull crap, as well as an overall summarization of the differences. Gather around and grab your marshmallows because this thing actually isn't that bad. Well, let me rephrase that. It is bad. A lot of the events actually play out fairly similarly and thus the same problems as before are present. However, there are a significant amount of differences and a a significant amount of extra content that provides missing context and gives us a peek into something completely different. Some of you may be thinking that it isn't even worth going over at all because none of it is in the movie and so therefore none of it is relevant to the film. Death of the author and all that. Normally I would absolutely agree with the sentiment. References from outside the film should not be pointed to as defenses or critiques to information that is or is not in a movie. However, to that I would say... Wow, you're no fun. Obviously, yes, none of my aforementioned critiques are going to change based on what's in this script. However, it's important to note that in addition to the extra content and improved scenes that we didn't have prior, which even by itself will provide us with some fairly interesting comparisons, this script actually has an ending. It doesn't just crawl desperately across the floor until Sony allows it to die. There's actually a conclusive end to the narrative that's worth discussing. And in the interest of this being a comprehensive review of this trash fire, I take no shame in saying that I want to see what the end of the movie is. To kick off, we have an entirely different opening than what we originally had. We are told the very brief story of Allison, a girl who disappeared along with all of her other friends simultaneously one day, after what is described as a mysterious fire 
liar in their school. We're given a brief little bit of intrigue of sorts with the police actually finding her after said disappearance. She is referenced as the one who came back. Which on its own is kind of a moment of, ooh, nifty. I wonder if they're going to do anything with that. They don't. Surprisingly enough, this is Allison's only addition to the film. The rest of her scenes unfortunately play out as we know them with little to no deviations. The only real noteworthy instance with her is where instead of this moron conversation, the script actually says this. An IM pops up in the chat box below, simple like a programmer's prompt. The name Alleycat93 next to it. Ren hits pause and reads. Letters appear in succession, forming two words. What's up? The prompt drops down waiting, the cursor blinking. Ren studies it for a moment. She quickly types. This is a friend of Katie's. The cursor blinks, a slow rhythm on and off. Alleycat93 responds. Then you're a friend of mine. A little smile. Ren takes that as encouragement. Types. She's missing. Of course she is. What did you tell her? What she wanted to know. Ren holds off, considering the cryptic message. Which was? The same thing you want to know. Ren's mouth drops open a bit, as if she's going to say something. So, yeah, that's already better than what we got. One thing that is worth mentioning is that all of this apparently takes place in 2001, meaning that the movie obviously takes place after these events rather than before or during. This is a bit of a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, this adds a level of depth to the timeline of the film, creating an interesting gap between Allison's reappearance and Katie's disappearance. Whereas the final cut was basically just saying to us, Whoa, she was crazy and then Slender Man took her! The script was apparently apparently telling us that she had already gone through that hell many years ago, and her purpose now is actually just to be a conduit of Slender Man meant to tempt and pull more people towards him. Bit spooky, and definitely adds a bit of depth that wasn't there before. However, on the other hand, the script isn't exactly clear on Allison's current whereabouts. The last we see of her is just her being thrown in good old Century Link's mental health department. No information is actually ever given to us on if she got out of the asylum at any point, or if they just threw a lap top into her solitary confinement cell. However, while I would say that the issue is certainly still present, it is definitely lessened with the information that we're provided with. All in all, this is a far superior opening to the film, and one that very quickly sets the tone for what the viewer is about to see. Allison is still a useless character, unfortunately, but this much-needed background for her provides a more personal connection, and allows the audience to be a bit more on edge when they realize that's the person Katie's been talking to. Contrasted with the final cut of the film, wherein she is a completely random and out-of-place exposition dump truck that's merely there because she literally has to be, because these three morons aren't going to be able to figure out what to do without her. What an incredible difference made by such a seemingly insignificant narrative addition. Typed words appear on a glowing screen, one letter at a time. No one ever saw them again. Exterior clearing. Day. Panning over girl's stuff, abandoned on dead grass. They left things in the clearing and walked into the trees, holding hands. A title card appears. Cumberland, Rhode Island. We keep panning over the discarded items. A journal, a photo, inexpensive jewellery, a bedazzled cell phone. But each item is either ripped or smashed. News video, that clearing, police search with dogs. One of the policemen holds up a teddy bear, torn in half. All the girls were like totally normal. None of them was on drugs or anything. One of them was like a girl scout, or explorer scout, or something like that. A rapid-fire series of class photos, teenage girls' faces, some freckled, most smiling. Jennifer, Ellen, Allison, Carly, Rebecca, Margot, Kylie. On video, a cheerleader talks directly into her webcam. The school library burned down the same day. It was pretty freaky, some pretty mysterious shit. News footage, police and firemen mill about a smouldering structure. A still-standing sign says Cumberland High School Library. On video, a boy with glasses talks to his webcam. I just can't see a natural fire burning that hot. I bet the only place anybody ever seen anything like that was in Hiroshima. Exterior, school library. Day. The same burned structure. Workers sift through the ashes. A fireman, standing amid the charred ruins of the library, holds up an intact surveillance camera. Black and white footage of the girls walking from the clearing into the woods. 
People said they heard screams coming from the woods. Follow a girl through waist high sunflowers, but Alison Riley wasn't like the others. She came back. Alison staggers slightly. The cop who found her said she was holding something. Turned out it was viewed from the front. Alison is holding something. She raises her eyes toward us and opens her hands as if offering what's in them. Some bloody mess of something. Her own tongue. Surveillance video, interior hospital day. Filmed through safety glass, inset in a door. The girl, Alison, has a haunted look on her face. They gave her a piece of paper and asked her to write down what happened, but she only wrote one word. Him. Frozen image from the library surveillance camera footage of the girls walking into the woods. Push into the background on a dark aberration, blurred and out of focus. An incomprehensible human shape. Hideously tall and thin, featureless, disproportionately long arms extending downwards, a terrifying faceless figure. Slender Man. The movie proceeds to play out as normal for a bit after this. A minor character building moment is provided to Katie during the opening bench scene, one which was weirdly replaced with the stupid sneezing pilgrims joke. PE teacher calling from the field. Katie, you're up. Katie brazenly ignores him. Haley gives her a look. Whatever. He'll give up after a second. He doesn't really want me having a heart attack on his field. The PE teacher indeed moves on. Haley smiles. I suppose it was more important to make a tee hee eye redhead have no soul joke rather than an actual character moment to establish an authority defiant trait, which would in turn contribute to a more solid initial motivation for wanting to run away. Which, by the way, Katie's desire to do so is much more prevalent in the script, at least enough to the point where her friends are aware of it. Certain lines of dialogue and the actions taken by the characters indicate that they actually believed Katie just ran away rather than just immediately jumping to the conclusion of, oh my god, she was kidnapped by Satan. It isn't actually until the girls see a dark figure in the background of a video Chloe shot that they begin to question it. Which, by the way, good time to bring up, holy goddamn crap, these characters actually seem like friends in this script. Like, my god, it's insane how much more apparent it is. After Katie's disappearance, the initial reaction is more of a denying and wishful one of, no, no, she'll be back to school tomorrow, rather than one of, we're all prisoners because of you. And that line's even still in the script. Another much-needed scene that was cut from the film deeply illustrates this further. That being the police questioning scene. I, I know, right? The police actually did something in the script. Let's take a look. Interior, school conference room, day. The blank white walls give it the feel of an interrogation room. Haley sits opposite a stern-faced principal and two police officers. When did you last see her? Confused and nervous, she chooses her words carefully. At the cemetery. And before that? Intercut, Haley, Chloe, Wren, speaking with the investigators. It was Saturday. We spent the night at Katie's house. We? Me, Chloe, and Haley. We slept in the basement. M Mr. Jensen was upstairs, passed out on the couch. Again. Where was her mother? She moved out a while back. Did Katie have a boyfriend? Have you seen the boys at this school? Maybe there was someone she didn't tell you about. No. She's my best friend. Since kindergarten. Would you say she was a happy girl? She used to be. But then her mum ran off with that yoga instructor. Did she ever talk about running away? Yeah, but we all did. I mean seriously, who hasn't memorized the bus schedule out of this shithole? Tears form in Haley's eyes as her voice falters. She wouldn't just leave. It happens more often than you'd imagine. The officers wrap things up. Is there anything else? Chloe hesitates. Anything you haven't told us? No. These lines of dialogue follow shortly after, which complements the scene nicely. Maybe Slenderman came for her. Haley scoffs. Or maybe she couldn't take Sergeant Drunk Dad anymore and ran away. And not say goodbye? To any of us? A silent but heavy beat. They all contemplate this for a long time. Oh my god, actually building characters through plot-relevant scenes, you say? 
unheard of. Obviously, though, I'm not going to just ignore the problems that are in this scene, namely this line here that says that this group of super close friends who all go to the same school apparently didn't talk to Katie at all in the week since watching the summoning video. Yeah, that seems a touch unlikely. I'll admit that this is something that the movie's got over the script, even if it's a minuscule thing. For comparison, the movie was basically saying to us they did not talk about the video with each other at all for the whole week despite having reoccurring nightmares about it, as well as a growing feeling of impending dread. The script here, on the other hand, is apparently offering us the alternative of they did not talk to each other at all. So, yeah, we kind of lose either way here, movie. But yeah, given the choice, I suppose you technically have the superior route here. Congratulations, you actually could have been worse. Probably the nicest thing I've said about you. Barring that little rough patch, this is absolutely a scene that I cannot comprehend a reason behind its removal. It actually just makes everything better. A, it gives the police a reason to believe Katie just straight up ran away rather than being kidnapped. This would obviously redirect their investigation away from anything that would lead them directly to Slenderman's not-so-proverbial doorstep. B, this scene, while not exactly the most original way to do it, is still a tried-and-true method of believably portraying exposition between characters characters and establishing any important motives or traits. We learn a significant amount about Katie here, on top of what I would dare say is a fairly well-executed moment for the audience to actually connect with these kids. These kids who are actually upset about their missing friend and how it's only just now starting to sink in. Other minor yet noteworthy differences include a significantly expanded and improved dinner table scene and a significantly expanded and improved basement scene. The summoning video still exists, unfortunately. However, even that little bundle of idiocy is still improved upon, if even ever so slightly, as the script opted to actually have the Slenderman summoning video be Slenderman related. Oh yeah, that's something that's worth mentioning. All that weird-ass Illuminati third-eye evil pregnancy crap, all of that is completely and utterly absent from this story. The flashy bit of the summoning video is revealed to actually be split-second flashes of Slenderman. Oh, there is this. This is weird. So, if we ignore the fact that we're putting the forest demon in a mansion now, I love how they make sure to inform us that the location of this hidden mansion is unknown. I wonder why this was cut. Anyway, one of the most significant points to reference and one of the main reasons the script is superior to the film is the angel scene. This was the part of the script I got to where I really started thinking, Oh, this is a way different tone to it, and one being much closer to what I would expect a Slender Man movie to have. When I said before that I couldn't comprehend a reason behind the police questioning scene not being in the film, it doesn't even come close to how much I cannot fathom why this is not in the movie. Its absence actually just makes it worse. Exterior, old cemetery. Why a cemetery? It's hardly worth a field trip. I mean, it's a goddamn cemetery? Large granite monuments, crumbling headstones form a crude skyline behind the gates of an old cemetery. Inside, a group of students follow a tour guide, Wren and our girls amongst them. This burial ground dates back to the Revolutionary War. Katie and Haley follow, lagging behind. Katie ignores the tour and stares off into the distance. POV, a tree line skirts the edge of the old cemetery. The trees tower above it. A dense, untamed forest, no way to see where one tree begins and another ends. Generations of soldiers have been laid to rest here since... Now the tour passes, a large mausoleum. Elaborate carvings are etched in the cracked and deteriorating stone walls. As the guide continues on, Katie steps away from the group. She drifts across, studying the massive grave. A life-sized bronze statue of an angel guards the entrance to the mausoleum. Decades of corrosion have turned the angel's skin a ghastly shade of green. Katie steps over and faces the lifeless statue. Years of weathering and erosion give the horrific appearance of black tears flowing from the angel's eyes. Mold grows in the dark stains that stream down her face. The tour guide's voice fades into the background as Katie absorbs the angel's empty gaze. We see a deep sadness in Katie's eyes, emotion hiding just under the surface. It overwhelms her. Tears begin to form, and just as her first tear is about to fall, it turns black and runs down her cheek. Then another one. 
Two dark tears drip from her eyes. Katie wipes them away. But the tears keep flowing, streaming down her face. Katie panics when she looks at her hands. Inky black liquid drips off her face and pools in the palm of her hands. Her panic turns to pain and she starts to choke. The black tears streak down her face, draining the colour from her skin. She looks back up, fighting for air. And the angel screams, but its face is now blurred and featureless, a blank void. Katie gasps for air, she can't look away. We see the terror in Katie's eyes as the statue rises up in front of her, growing taller, morphing into a towering slender figure, arms reaching downward. Katie stands paralysed, she can't move, it has control over her body, she can't breathe, she can't scream. Katie? Katie's body jolts as she snaps out of the vision. We see Haley's face. She stands right in front of Katie. Everything is back to normal. The angel stands silently outside the mausoleum. Katie? Katie looks around, confusion all over her face. Tour guide to Katie. You okay, young lady? Looks like you've seen a ghost. Katie shakes her head. Well, you wouldn't be the first. As the group continues on, Katie's eyes are drawn again to the distant tree line. Holy dear mother of God, why would you cut that? This scene is actually more unsettling and horror-like than pretty much any of the other dumbass dribble that you ended up vomiting onto the final cut. Not only that, but it's one that actually makes sense and isn't just Slenderman going, Wooga, 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 okay, bye, see you in half an hour. Slenderman was clearly about to take Katie here, and the only reason he didn't is because Hallie interrupted him. Not only that, but seeing Katie's reaction to all of this is insanely more layered than what we ended up getting in the film. We're basically watching Katie lose her mind as she's panicking at the blood pouring out of her eyes. Eyeballs. And the darker implications to this is that this is just the routine predatory Slenderman procedure used to distract her long enough to swallow her up whole. That is horrific. And then you compare it to other scenes from the film. Not even just the film's counterpart of this, but let's look at the closest comparison we can find. Slenderman teleports into Chloe's bedroom and proceeds to go, ho ho ho, I got your nose. And after that, she starts putting her eyeliner on a little thicker. Yeah. <laughs> She big spooky. Yeah. She is dissolution. <laughs> Bravo, Sony. Or Screen Gems. Whatever moron decided it was a good idea to leave this scene out. You actually removed what was probably one of the best scare scenes you had and replaced it with, she stares off in the woods. Okay. Cool. As the script goes on, a lot of the scenes remain fairly similar for the most part, mainly with just tinier improvements here and there. Many of the same issues I've highlighted earlier are still present. This includes the breaking and entering scene, which plays out almost identically to its film counterpart. Alternatively, an overarching improvement to the film is Hallie's parents and their significantly larger role in the film. There are a plethora of reasonably well-done character moments between them and Hallie, which don't necessarily add a lot to the plot provided, but help create that connection with our main character that was so incredibly absent otherwise. Also, as I said, Warren begins suspecting Slenderman because of a video on Chloe's phone, something that all three of them struggle with to differing degrees. This is in contrast to the final cut where Warren basically just walks up and says, yeah, Slenderman's doing this. We need to go to Katie's house now. Uh oh, that's a, that's a bit out of nowhere, Ren. What, what evidence do you have to back this up? Diana, we did watch that video on summoning him. So... That actually means nothing. Yeah, but I felt something. Okay, you did too. The fates have already been decided, my friends. The gods have spoken to me in my dreams and informed me that I have been chosen as the prophet who will guide the worthy through the turbulent times ahead. Katie's father still gets out of prison the day after assaulting a kid in her bedroom. So... That's still stupid. However, the scene is extended and made a lot more tense because Warren decided to not just instantly wake him up in the script. They actually tried the slightly more sentient option of sneaking in first. It isn't actually until Ren knocks something over and startles him awake that she sneaks out of the back and rings the doorbell to get his attention away from Hallie and Chloe, who at this point are hiding from him as he moves through the house with a gun looking for the intruder. Moving on, we have even more small upgrades in quality throughout. Instead of this hilarity, the scene 
scene is significantly more unsettling with the choking being replaced with Chloe frantically scratching at horrific lesions that are climbing up her arms and over her face. Slender Man is more drenched in shadow in this scene, making him harder to distinguish from the tree line, so Hallie isn't even sure if what she's seeing isn't just pareidolia. The library scene is actually good now because instead of just oh it's dark oh slender man the scene actually has a level of build up and tension starting with a single light going out when ren goes to tell the librarian that she just saw about it she realizes that she's alone now and upon realizing this the other light fixtures start bursting around her slowly encasing her in darkness non-specific dissolution is still here thank god and oh Oh, what's this? Chloe has some new scenes. This character actually has more content. Apparently, she actually calls them and has a creepy conversation with them out on the road immediately after they leave her house. Afterwards, we have a scene where she comes back to school. That's pretty neat. So the answer to my earlier question of what is Chloe's mother doing about Chloe's growing insanity is literally nothing. I guess her mom decided to send her back to school while she was in the middle of her psychological breakdown. Happily dressing her daughter up for school and waving at her as she gets on the school bus while telling her to have fun with all of the sharp objects that she's going to be using in biology class today. Her reintroduction shows Hallie approaching her in the hallway upon being shocked to find her at the school again. She asks her if she's okay, and Chloe basically responds by maniacally laughing at her. Lovely, so the answer is no. What say you, Hallie? I trust you'll take this as the blaring red siren that it is, that perhaps Chloe shouldn't have access to the surgical equipment today. I know that informing one of your many Charlie Brown adults in the area isn't necessarily the best play, but perhaps it isn't entirely needed. Just keep an extra close eye on her yourself so that if she keeps acting insane at everyone, potential tragedy can be or not. You never fail to disappoint, Hallie. Surprisingly enough, Chloe actually survives this scene, to which I honestly didn't think was the case originally. The scene concludes with her being taken off by an ambulance, meaning she has another scene. Her next appearance is actually in the hospital scene after Lizzie goes nuts. Yeah, it turns out all this crap wasn't meant to be here originally. Shocker, huh? The scene itself is probably one of my favorites simply because of how hilarious it is. Hallie enters the hospital room after seeing some balloons with Chloe's name on them. Upon entering, she finds the bed is actually empty until she hears Chloe calling out to her from a wheelchair facing the window. After asking how she knew it was her, Chloe informs her that she can smell her perfume. As Hallie approaches, Chloe begins acquiring the crazy smile as she begins rambling on about how she couldn't stop Slender Man and how he'll never stop. Much to Hallie's horror, Chloe then begins clawing at the bandages on her eyes, and despite her best efforts to stop her, she succeeds in removing them, thus revealing that she has two X's deeply cut into her eyeballs. This subsequently chases Hallie out of the room as Chloe starts screaming after her over and over, I can still see. Where am I going? We won't need eyes to see couple funny implications that become rather prevalent here. One being that this moron apparently couldn't wrestle a scalpel out of a teenage girl's hands before she successfully carved two X's into both of her eyes. Gold star for you, man. I imagine you're one of those people who has a hard time opening new ketchup bottles, aren't you? The second implication here is that the doctors apparently just ignore their patients here when they start randomly screaming insane crap at their visitors truly beautiful. Tom also has his death scene after this. It's pretty funny. However, this is the point where I'd like to actually direct attention to the end of the film, where we can begin discussing the hands-down biggest change from script to film. The ending. How amazing is that? We're actually going to be able to see the ending of this idiocy. The ending that Sony deemed unworthy for us. Let's see what we got here. So it turns out we're going with the mansion thing. What the fuck? Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> you guys are actually doing that, huh? Slender Man lives in a mansion, huh? Sure, why not? Compliments the summoning video pretty nicely. Warren apparently found that Allison posted some random numbers before she deleted her account. Further research showed that these same numbers were posted by other users as well shortly before their accounts were terminated or after people were asking them how to stop Slender Man. A good old Google search finds that these numbers are actually coordinates. And upon checking these coordinates, we find that they are the super super secret code to the location of Slender Man's hidden mansion, and it's conveniently within driving distance. <laughs> 
So hell yeah, go into Slenderman's mansion, everyone. Why are we doing this? What are we going to accomplish by walking through the gates of hell and confronting Satan on his throne? I don't know. Wow, I, I actually can't believe that this is what they're going with. Never in a million years would I have thought this was going to be the ending of this movie. It's a weird mixed feeling of giddy excitement that I actually get to see how this goofy crap is about to play out, but at the same time slightly melancholy that we didn't actually get to see it because this looks hilarious in addition to the fact that it actually is better than what we ended up getting let that sink in for a minute Hallie and Ren going to Slenderman's house and telling him to leave them alone is a better ending than what Sony gave us but my god Slenderman's hidden mansion whose location is unknown is the original finale point of this film what an unexpected turn this story took apparently these two don't even know what they're going to do either the reasoning behind why they should go there is because these coordinates are what people keep giving to others who are asking how to stop him Ren says and I quote what if there's a way to save Lizzie to save all of us maybe even Katie we can take my mom's car. I will say fair enough because, yeah, what the hell else are you going to do? But that's, that's not going to stop me from laughing at you. Additionally, Google Maps even has it tagged and the actual image of the location is blurred out like a government base would be. So, damn, I guess it isn't actually unknown. Apparently, you can just straight up look the place up on Google Maps. I wonder if the police ever tried looking for all those missing kids at the weird pixely spot in South Carolina labeled Slender Man's Mansion. Apparently, it's on the direct front of his Wikipedia entry, but Slender Man thwarted any investigative efforts by editing it to saying it's hidden and unknown so as the two head out they start seeing katie in the distance beckoning them and drawing them in and such when they finally reach the mansion they see her head inside and think this is still a great idea and head on in themselves also this is our payoff for the gate and the bells by the way the implication we're being given is that the bell is literally slender man's doorbell isn't that beautiful? Even after hearing her weirdly laugh at nothing and seeing her blare witching off in the corner, Hallie and Warren still decide it's a good idea to run up and start conversing with her. The scene that follows, however, I, I will say is pretty neat. A nifty little payoff that we never got with Katie's disappearance. The girl slowly turns around. She looks up at them, dark circles around her eyes. It's Katie. The girls rush towards her. Katie! The lights from their phones splash off the walls, light bouncing around the room. Are you okay? But Katie doesn't speak. Come on, let's go. Ren grabs Katie's hand, but she violently pulls away. Katie, what are you doing? Come on. Still, she doesn't move. It's like she doesn't even see them. And then Katie speaks. We live here now. Katie looks to the ceiling high above their heads. With him. Here in the absence, Katie looks directly at them. In the nothing. And at that exact same moment, the girl's phones die. The flashlights disappear and the room goes dark. Katie, please! Let's go, goddammit! The girl grabs Katie's hands, but she won't move. It's like she's carved in stone. Her body's stiff and rigid. Then a haunting sound fills their ears. A bell echoes outside. It filters through the walls. The girls freeze. A shiver rolls down their spines. Suddenly, Katie arches backwards and a sound comes out of her lungs. A rush of air bursts from her mouth and her body lifts off the floor, levitating, drifting upwards. Ren and Haley can't speak. They can't move. Frozen as they watch Katie lift into the air, ten thousands of tiny whispers filter out of the walls. The voices of lost children swirling and crying for help. Ren and Haley spin around, but there's nobody there. Only Katie hovering in midair, drifting towards the ceiling. He's here. As soon as she speaks the words, dark tentacles crawl down the walls like black veins, spiderwebbing in all directions. Haley and Ren's eyes follow the tentacles up to an inky black torso melting out of the ceiling. Haley and Ren stand frozen, entranced by the terrible figure. Long, thin arms forming reaching towards Katie as she floats upwards. Her body warps and deforms, and she is absorbed by the figure dropping down from above. Then a face evolves, staring at them without eyes, a blank, empty void. Ren starts to bolt for the door, but Haley just stands there. Ren grabs her and spins her around. Haley, run! 
yes, Hallie and Ren are idiots. This is known. Obviously, don't approach the weird candy truck here, guys. What did you honestly think was going to happen? Especially after you approach her and she starts saying weird crap at you, you'd think that would immediately be a moment of, well, this isn't going to work. Sorry, Katie, I tried. However, that being said, I can't even necessarily say it's a problem with the scene because it's absolutely something these two morons would do. Also, yeah, going to Slenderman's mansion was a bad idea. Shocker. A chase scene ensues, one that actually plays out for a decent amount of time, and in a rather cliched way, Ren actually ends up sacrificing herself for the sake of buying time for Hallie. She goes on to say that all of this is her fault, and the aforementioned rather melodramatic line of, you go, I can buy you some time. Definitely a bit of an eye roller, but then you consider the alternative. <laughs> and the thought occurs that, yep. Yeah, this actually isn't that bad. From here on out, the movie plays out as normal with its taking of Hallie with a few notable differences. With that in mind, let's take a look. This close, Haley can recognize that Slenderman's suit isn't a suit. His tie isn't a tie. The suit is mottled fleshy. The tie is just a smear of reddish liquid where his face should be is a roiling mass of some unknown substance. Finally, a look of acceptance on Haley's face and then, the world brightens all around us. Shadows disappear as the skies fill with light. Is it the first ray of light as the sun peeks over the horizon? Or something else? Haley gasps as a blinding light explodes all around her. It slowly dissipates, and we see the large, gnarled oak tree. But now a towers over a clearing in the woods. A silent, empty void. An absence. The mansion has vanished into nothing. Cut to, interior, Lizzie's bedroom, months later, night. Lizzie sits at her computer, designing a missing flyer with Haley's picture on it. We can see Lizzie has recovered from her mental episode, but she's definitely worse for wear. And then, Lizzie. Lizzie listens, not sure what she heard. She gets up and crosses to her door, opens it, peers out, nobody there. But just as Lizzie goes to close her door, Lizzie. Lizzie turns, exits her room to investigate. Haley? Interior, Haley's house, hallway, continuous. Lizzie moves down the hall, still nobody there. Lizzie. She sees the back door open, heads that way. Exterior, Haley's house, night. Lizzie enters the backyard, looks around. Haley? But nobody is there. Only the forest behind the house. A tear rolls down Lizzie's cheek as she searches the endless trees. No Haley, just tangled branches. We can't tell where one ends and another begins. And then we hear something, unmistakable. A bell echoes in the forest. And off Lizzie's scream, we smash cut to black. The end. Damn, what a surprise. The script actually had a superior closing scene, in that it had a closing scene. It wasn't just Lizzie aimlessly mumbling into a microphone about viruses. A rather important detail to take note of here is that apparently this was the first time we actually got to see Slender Man up close in the original version. Actually amazingly done. That is absolutely the route they should have taken. In the final cut, Slender Man was stuffing his non-existent face into the screen every 10 minutes, but Apparently, David Burke actually realized how horror works and decided he should save the reveal of what Slender Man fully looks like until the end of the movie. Imagine that. With that in mind, that means that all of the other scenes he was in had to have had him obscured or in some way not fully visible so that we could get this reveal in the first place. That alone improves some of these scenes tenfold. And so, Mr. David Burke, even though you crammed several obvious elements from The Ring, Event Horizon, Horizon, Sinister, Blair Witch, possibly The Haunting, and I'm, I'm pretty sure others I'm forgetting to mention, into this script, you gave Slender Man a mansion and tagged his location on Google Maps so our characters would know where to go, you made Chloe the funny crazy person, you gave Hallie and Tom an utterly hilarious Romeo and Juliet scene, where the two yell at each other from their respective positions while the gathering crowd simply observes and nods at the whole ordeal, you did pretty much every single 
single goofy ass thing you could have possibly done with this movie, just short of casting Tommy Wiseau as Slender Man, and it's still infinitely better than what we ended up getting, because you were actually able to write the characters with a believable sense of humanity, and you know how to write decent horror scenes with building tension. Rather than just flashing Illuminati crap across the screen and calling it horror, you actually wrote a horror movie even if it wasn't necessarily that good of one. And don't mistake my praise for the characters as one for calling them deep, because they aren't. It's important to note that this script doesn't necessarily convey multiple layers of these people, moreover than it does a humanity that was very much lacking in what we just watched. It doesn't take much, but an extra line here, or a different action there, really changes things up. And that's what a lot of this was. Because in the end, most of the scenes did play out pretty much the same as before. The differences came more so in the nuance that was ripped away. There's a very short scene where Hallie comes home after her date with Tom and just breaks down crying because of everything that's happening. And this is an example of something where a Sony boardroom executive would look at it and say, this doesn't advance the story, nor is it a scene that Slenderman is in cut it, without actually realizing, or more importantly, caring, that this is absolutely a necessary scene because it gives us a moment to connect with our protagonist, even if it's a short and seemingly irrelevant one. In addition to this, this also puts a couple of these random ass shots from the movie into a different context. Remember this idiocy? In the film, this was lap number two around the funhouse of stupidity during the hospital scene. Hallie walks around for a bit, weird crap happens, and then her parents wake her up, and then we cut immediately to her walking through the hospital again. Bit weird, so what happens in the script? Oh, this is literally right after Tom's death. Hallie just watched her boyfriend splatter himself across the pavement. Yeah, that's probably gonna have an effect on someone. Rather explains the deadpan expression here, huh? At this point, she's just had Chloe scream at her about being crazy, followed almost immediately by her crush leaping to his death in front of her very eyes. Those are some emotions we probably needed to see, huh? Maybe give us a little bit more of a connection with this character that wasn't present before, knowing what's going on through her head instead of just assuming it's just, well, now we're walking this way. I'm actually finding myself wishing that this would have been a Blumhouse movie at this point, and that's saying something. Because the thing is, is Jason Blum doesn't actually care if a movie he makes flops or not. Screen gems here have to worry about that, but it doesn't matter as much to Jason, because all he does is throw minuscule budgets at filmmakers, which almost guarantees a profit for him no matter what. The approach to his company is, oh, you want to make a horror film? Okay, here's $3 million, go nuts. And then David Burke here could have actually made this movie, this goofy-ass horror movie where Slender Man lives in a mansion and reality is falling apart because of all of the narrative problems that are still bleeding from this script, mixed with a plethora of slightly less terrible characters than before and decently written horror scenes. I'll take it, especially when you compare it to this. Hey, come here, look at my face. <laughs> 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 oh my god. <laughs> 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 Jesus Christ. And that's the other thing about all of this, and the thing that I need to make clear because of how nice I have been to the script. This still isn't a good movie. Barring a few that were fixed with additional context given with certain deleted scenes, almost all of the same problems I mentioned in this video are still present in the script. And even a couple new ones are apparent here and there throughout. These are problems that absolutely need to be fixed if you want your story to be well written and have that level of logistical consistency. Had this been the movie we got, this video would still exist. I, I just wouldn't have to have skipped over the last 30 minutes of it because of how there was nothing to talk about. The difference here is that this is actually a story. I do not exaggerate when I say that the film's story stopped after Hallie's date with Tom and that's me being generous. The actual last plot point in the film was the forest sacrifice scene. Everything else past that was just filler to get us to the end. And, and a possible ritual to bring forth the Kali Yuga, but we won't talk about that. It is actually an unforgivable thing. It is my largest criticism above all else, and it is why this story, while still overall being a poor one, is 100% preferable in every single regard, and why the points of it that do deserve credit should see them. Slender Man 2018 is an incomplete movie. It is an abandoned project that somehow managed to get released. Unironically, 
release the Burke cut. Note that while it may look like it, this is not an instance of the new stupid trend of, hey guys, you should release a different version of this poorly received film that suffered from creative differences and studio interference. No, this is an instance of, you should release this film. The tech demo you gave us was pretty awful, but there's something there. And also, I want to see Slenderman's mansion. I'll admit a level of bias for that reason. See if Jason Blum would be willing to buy the rights away from these morons. Maybe he has an editor who knows how to do color grading correctly. Thank you all so much for watching. This project expanded a lot more than I originally thought it would, and I'm incredibly happy to have finally gotten to share it with you all. Thanks so much to Platinum Okami, Got Mittens, Nox Cerberus, Grimpedia, TCAP, Jake, Madvocat, Southpaw, and Evan for joining me through this deeply mud-filled trench. Some of these people have their own content as well, and I would thoroughly encourage you to check them out. The links to their respective channels and the like will be in the description below. Before I fade us into silence once more, I have one final thing to leave you with. This is called Don't Look at His Shadows. It was written by myself and Got Mittens with some story additions assisted by Platinum Okami. It is narrated by the incredibly talented Ben Down from Play the Game and Hurt Records, another fellow whose links are listed below and you should go give a look. Happy Halloween, everyone. And until our paths cross once more, I bid you farewell. Release the Burke Cut. The picture he took of this trailhead was the last thing I received from him. I will get him back. I will find him. He's not gone. I don't care what anyone says. I can still hear his voice every night when I'm on the edge of sleep. We've always had that connection. I feel that bond now. Stronger every minute. Especially now that I'm here. I feel it pulling. I feel myself being drawn towards him. I will find him. I will find him. Intuition says to follow this trail. But I know he didn't go this way. There's been a thorough investigation down this place. What am I going to find that the police haven't already? They refuse to listen to me, but I, I can't blame them. The terrain was too steep. And when they started past the first ravine, they told me there was no evidence of anyone passing through. No footprints and no displaced rocks or terrain. They said he couldn't possibly have gone this way. And they're wrong. I know I'm right. They're wrong. They're wrong. Being here for myself, I know I'm right. I feel it more than I ever have. I just have to take it slow. I have everything I need and I'm ready. I will find him. I will find him. This is exactly the path that Sam would have followed. This is the kind of shit he'd absolutely do. See a path to the right and a cliff on the left, and he'd be grabbing the repelling gear every single time. I'm at the bottom now, and all I see are trees in front of me. Nothing but trees. An endless sea of oak. I can't go back now. But this cold is almost overwhelming. It's baffling to me. I'm not weak. Checking my watch, it's still 55 degrees. Not out of the ordinary for a typical fall evening. My skin isn't cold, but I've never felt so chilled. It's as if a silent wind has cut through me into my very core. I feel something tugging in the back of my mind. What is that? Trepidation? No, I can't let that happen. I'm not letting doubt take over now. I will find him. I know he's this way. First step forward and I'm immediately struck with the realization of what I'm looking at. This forest is what his room has become. A beautiful mural that stretched all the way across his walls and over his door. He had transformed his bedroom into this endless forest. I observed it as I sat on my brother's bed, praying for guidance soaking in the last act of such a talented painter. No, no, not last.
get that out of your head. The most recent act. No room for doubt. The more I observed and the longer I observed, the more haunting the imagery becomes. What was on initial viewing a beautiful mural of a forest became an apparent facade for something much darker. It was the shadows that pulled me in and filled me with a dread that hadn't been there before. He was too detail-oriented, and many of these shadows don't match the trees. They bend and contort themselves in unnatural fashions. And as I try to trace the lines of these shadows back to their source, I find the decay and rot that was not apparent to me before. Now as I look around, it's all-encompassing, consuming the very forest around me. I find myself in a clearing surrounded by a ring of oak trees carved with words, almost like runic symbols, and this is the only sanctuary from this rot. Words repeating, repeating, repeating the phrases. He steals their voices and don't look at the shadows. They repeat in an almost rhythmic and mystical fashion. As I spin around searching for answers, this rot seems to be growing. More vivid by the second. The imagery of my brother's work is so detailed and astounding that I swear I can smell the acrid air and the molding wood. I can hear and feel the wind whispering and the foliage rustling and falling around me. Reacting to a breeze that isn't there. I can feel it cold against my skin, like an icy hand pushing me forward. I stop, and the first thing I see is the tree. There's something different about this one. With the previous dogma of this beautiful imagery being stripped away by the reality of what lies beneath it, and this tree stands out as full of life. The shadow is playing on it, bringing it an almost unnatural and inhuman and horrific liveliness. And now that I've noticed it, it almost seems separate from the rest of the forest. Like it was placed here from a different painting. I see the shadows of the mural almost dancing with life on the corner of my vision. And as I lean closer still, this carving is writing. Writing arranged in this ornate circle. A circle that's deeply cut through the bark of the tree and into its flesh. Sap bleeds like an unclotting wound. I lean ever closer to try and discern the words. They're barely distinguishable, but clearly the work of my brother. I need to see what this says. This is important. This is a clue. This is how I find them. Nobody else would know. And with my nose mere inches from the mural, I squint and desperately try to discern the wording. I take one step. I turn around, looking to go back, knowing I've made a horrible mistake. But all I see before me is the carved oak. I turn around and it's still there, the same distance from me. No. What's happening? What's going on? Am I in the painting? Am I dreaming? Why is this happening? This isn't possible. This isn't real. This isn't real. No. This is real. I am here. My name is Daniel. My brother's name is Samuel. I'm 26 years old. Samuel has been missing for two and a half weeks. The police have just called off their searches and have been recommending a private investigator. Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail? A smile from a veil. Can you tell a green field from a cold steel a smile from a veil. I know that voice. I know that song. It was the last song we saw our father perform. Singing it always brought us together. 
why am I thinking of it now? No, you know why you're thinking of this. Stop, push it out of your head. He's not gone. More heroes for ghosts, hot ash and trees, hot air for a cool breeze. Stop it, stop it, stop More it. Wait, for ghosts, for this isn't in my head. That's hot Samuel, I can hear him. He's here. I turn and begin running towards his voice, towards the oak. Any of the fear and hesitation that was in my mind is now gone. And euphoria fills my senses and the only thoughts in my head. I'm going to bring him home. I'm going to bring him home. My sprint slows as I grow closer before I come to a dead stop. I slowly turn my head to assess my surroundings. Is it darker now? No. No, it's not. I look over my shoulder towards the clearing. It's significantly further but reachable in just a few seconds of walking. A deep-rooted knot, ever growing in my stomach, makes it seem oh so much further away. And around me, the quiet howl of the wind slowly shifts the tree branches and coldly caresses my skin. How I wish, how I wish you were here. How I wish, how I wish you were here. I turn back towards the oak, strangely illuminated in this closing darkness around me. And it stands a mere 20 feet away from me. The shadow still swaying around the trunk and its carved words only barely out of my ability to discern them. I take a step backward. I am immediately filled with the same deep and visceral dread I had before. The oak didn't get any further away. No, this isn't real. My eyes are playing tricks on me. No, this isn't real. I take three steps back and my stomach painfully clenches as I watch the oak in growing anticipation. It's still the same distance from me as before. No, no, this isn't real. This can't be real. I close my eyes and my senses are almost immediately overwhelmed with the sounds of voices. Voices that diminish and back away upon my opening of them. And with that, I realized these voices had always been here. Sam's was always the most prominent, but these were just at the edge of his, barely recognizable whispers that I foolishly mistook as the wind. I tilt my head ever so slightly skyward, ensuring that I maintain my view of the oak tree from the bottom of my vision. The trees seem alive with their movements as I watch their swaying branches throw shadows against the earth and one another. A nearly synchronized performance in which I am its only audience. I bring my head down again. I don't have a choice. I need to go to Oak. I need to know what the words say. I need to know. I take one step. And the oak that was previously still 20 feet away from me is now towering directly over me. Its smooth light bark shining to me like a beacon in this overwhelming darkness. Eerily overtaking the forest with its unnatural, horrifying presence. Its hauntingly beautiful appearance tainted only by the dark sap that still creeps downward from the deeply inscribed words that I can finally recognize. Not words. Symbols. I narrow my eyes and examine the would-be letters before me that are almost hieroglyphic. No, this... No. This is something else. I tilt my head to try and see the letters, staring intently as though doing so long enough would allow me to recognize this unknown language. I trace my finger around the cuts. The bark is smooth, almost polished in direct contrast to the foreign cuts in its skin. My head bolts up and I look around. The voice came from directly behind me this time. 
and around me the trees continue to sway and to creak but I can't see anyone. I slowly move in a circle trying to take in every part of my surroundings. Every bush, every tree, every shadow, all the shadows, all these shadows that don't match to the trees casting them, surrounding me, enclosing me in darkness. As my eyes dart along all of them, desperately trying to link them to their sources, a single word leaves my mouth. I can't even be sure if I'm the one who chose to speak or if they just escaped my lips in my growing uncertainty. Sam? Where's you? Where's you? Where's you? I spin around again back towards the oak. It was Sam's voice singing directly behind me. For the briefest of moments, my fear was gone once again until my thoughts were immediately cut off by what was standing in front of me. A darkened vision of a man staring down at me, its face unseen and hidden by the shadows dancing around it. Dressed neatly in a black business suit and tie, drastically contrast against the natural world surrounding him he stood almost completely obscured by the shadows towering over me bringing me to realize how he could have been there the entire time mistaken for one of the trees swaying in the darkness and although i can't see a face i know a judgment was being passed on me I am immediately overwhelmed by the voices, an unending eternal dark symphony that attacks me from all sides, with the orchestrator bearing down upon me, a million batons raising their voices to the highest degree in my mind, tightening over me like a snake. I don't know if I've remained standing or if I've been put to the ground, but I can't see. My vision is being shaken so violently as I feel my body crumble. Every single negative emotion that's possible to experience strikes me in a torturous unison. Hatred, anger, fear, doubt, sadness, disgust, all erupting in my mind in their strongest forms, assaulting every fiber of my being. There's something else, something approaching. Its presence gaining strength by each horrendous second. It's not death, no, not death, it's, it's the end. An all-encompassing end of everything. The voices are growing louder, languages I don't understand or even recognize, assaulting me from every angle deafening me, louder still, growing with the same intensity as that ever-present impending end. That end has always been here. It was here from the second I stepped out of the clearing, scraping of my consciousness, singing into my ears with the voice of my brother. Drawing me in, and I sprang the trap. Then as suddenly as it started, it all stopped. I find myself on the ground. Staring skywards, my senses numb and my memories irrelevant. I stare at the inky black starless sky stretching out before me. Only the very tops of the trees are visible to me. The thin jagged branches of black reaching upward. Only distinguishable through the sea of dark blue above them. We're just two souls swimming in a fishbowl. There it is. I see you now. You almost got it right. But you just barely missed something. His lisp is gone. That lisp he's had his entire life. How did I miss that? 
Slowly my eyes moved downward to see the source that pulled me in. There he stands in the clearing, watching me. His face more clear to me now as I look over the blank canvas that covers his head. A painting that is yet to be finished. I notice now that he's different though. Instead of a pristine black suit, I see him dressed in white satin. Two large circular gold plates adorn his shoulders and one hangs from his collar. And to his chest he tightly grips a golden sickle. He remains completely still, watching me from his statuesque pose, clearly waiting for my next decision. And it's in that moment that I notice something new. The shadows around him, flickering and wavering around him, appearing in the trees and the foliage. There are more, all watching me. And as I quietly observe all of this, allowing the imagery to soak into my mind. My fading vision finally realizes the final detail. Besides the man with the sickle, stands a boy. His face dark, but still clearly observing me. He slowly looks up at the man, who doesn't react to his presence. And before looking back towards me, he quietly lifts his hand and waves to me, and the beginnings of a smile begin to tug at the corners of my mouth. As the darkness encloses onto me, and I can feel the sting of the voices creeping into my mind once more, one stands out above the rest, one that assures me and comforts me in whatever will follow. <laughs>